Imagine a world where hip hop's biggest stories, the juiciest gossip, and the most heated beats are just a click away. In the eye of this storm of controversies, there stands a figure who has emerged as the voice of a generation, a trailblazer in digital media, masterfully shaping the narrative of modern hip hop culture. He's not a rapper or a producer, but his influence rivals the biggest names in the industry. With over 5 million followers on Instagram, 1.4 million on Twitter, and over 2.5 million on YouTube, DJ Academics has slowly become one of the most recognizable names and faces in all of hip hop. How did a kid from Jamaica with a love for music become the center and attention of hip hop? Today, we're gonna to be taking a look at the insane rise of DJ Academics. One screenshot or gif, one watermark, and a simple voiceover. Check it, up, check it out now. That's all it took for DJ Academics to build a brand and a business that has allowed him to amass a net worth upwards of $10 million. But Academics didn't come into the game with an advantage over others. He didn't start at the top. In fact, Academics' upbringing was turbulent to say the least, but his story proves that even with the humblest of beginnings, a person who applies themselves and follows their dreams can be rewarded with immense success. Livingston Island Jr., known to the world as DJ Academics, was born May 7, 1991, in Spanish Town, Jamaica. But one of the most dangerously notorious areas in Jamaica, situated right outside the bustling capital city of Kingston. At grew up just outside of Spanish Town in a smaller country area called Clarendon. Picture this, Spanish Town and its surrounding areas, like Clarendon, are so perilous that even the U.S. State Department had to issue warnings to American citizens against venturing there when they were traveling. It's not your everyday neighborhood, that's for sure. The challenges plaguing this area can be broadly categorized into three main areas. Economic struggles, because they face typical urban economic woes marked by unemployment and poverty, fueling various social issues. Two, crime and gang violence, because the area is a battleground basically for gang conflicts, and then three, inadequate infrastructure and services because the area struggles with shortcomings in healthcare, education, and public utilities. This is the place the academics called home until he was 10 years old. His mother, a dedicated school teacher, and his father, a principal at the same school, raised academics and his three brothers. Now, Act describes his parents initially as having a solid relationship. However, his father, a man of local influence, eventually strayed and started stepping out on Axe's mom, eventually starting a new family and leaving Axe's mom to single-handedly raise her children after the two divorced. But I never grew up around my father, but I gave a lot. My mom had three boys. Let me tell you this, for women who, had, who have had all men, I salute you. I'm gonna give you another reason why I salute those women. Because my father had another family. And by the way, yes, I get people hit me up like, oh, I'm your sister. Uh, no, you're not. I definitely tell them, no, you're not. Hey, I'm, the family who I got is the people who I grew up with. Not because my father was slanging wherever he wanted. Now, he was a principal, but he was a very well-revered and established man in Jamaica. So a lot of women wanted him. He married my mom, but he started stepping out. And I used to hate him for that, but I understood as, uh, as time went on. Because we're... And when you're in reality and you got money, some fame, this and third, one woman, it don't be working out like that. Unfortunately, my mom did catch, I think, the bad end of it because even though she was married to him and she had kids with him, he eventually found another woman and did another family. So I grew up mostly with my mom, then my grandmother. He ended up passing away. Um, we did have very crucial conversations before he, he died. I love him. Um, even though, you know, as a kid, you always feel hurt if your father is not with your mom. But one of the things I realized in even having the conversations is like, you have to be a man to understand. As a kid, you won't understand. I became a man. I realized I like mad. I like doing my thing all over the place. So I, I was able to understand him. That's it. It was a forgiveness I needed to have. And luckily I did that before he died. So I have no resentment against my father. I'm a junior. I have the same name as him. I look exactly like him. 
I think he's a good man. He's a great man. But because my mom did so much of the legwork, I'm a mama's boy. I'm always going to be a mama's boy. Life in Jamaica wasn't easy. In pursuit of a better life, Axe's mother made a bold move. She landed a temporary visa to America, but faced a tough decision. She couldn't bring her kids along. So she decided to leave Axe and his brothers with their grandmother and embarked on a journey to the U.S. enduring minimum wage jobs and living in subpar conditions. Despite her hardships, she was unwavering in her support for her family back home, sending care packages and barrels whenever she could to try to ease their lives. At recalls being convinced that his mother was rich because of the support that she managed to provide. When her visa expired, she chose to overstay, believing life in the U.S., even undocumented, was better than life back in Jamaica. Act visited his mother in the US, but his visits were intermittent and he always returned to his grandmother's or his extended family like his aunt and his uncles when he was done visiting. His mother, determined to reunite her family, eventually married an American, paying a hefty $20,000 for the arrangement. This step finally paved the way for her citizenship and the subsequent relocation of Act and one of his brothers to the US in 2001. Daddy had another family. Mama going, like, mama did all this stuff. She came to America. She overstayed her visa. She did all this stuff. Like, she married a new, I could say now, because I can't run it back. I, I think they charged her 20 bands to get married, just for her to get her, her citizenship. She brought me over here, brought my brother over here. And I remember, you know, she used to send stuff to us in Jamaica. It was like, I thought America was paradise, bro. I lived in Jamaica. Let me show you our pictures. You know why? Because she used to send back so much great stuff. So I'm like, yeah, my mom got to be hella rich. Came here. First of all, I experienced snow for the first time. Ew. At JFK. And then I realized, I said, damn, my mom isn't rich. She made it seem like she was rich. And by the way, this is for anyone who grew up with their mom. I do think a real household means a man and a woman but for the woman who can do by themselves who don't sacrifice her kids so after i see what I, my mom did she came over here she wasn't as rich as i thought she was even though she was sending mass to us in jamaica i came here and um i realized my mom was working three jobs if you never come came from a caribbean country let me give you the experience my mom graduated high school, went to a teacher's college, which means a college meant to specifically groom you and teach you how to be a teacher that you could, you know, teach other kids. She did all that and she was a teacher for like five plus years. Yet, when she came to the United States, this, this is how the United States views third world countries. They said to her, we don't respect your teaching certificate, but call it that. We don't respect the fact you went to college. My mother was going to college when I was in college. I want to put this in perspective. So my mom had to re go to college in New Jersey while she already went to college and was a whole teacher. But when you come from certain countries, they look at it like, oh, that's a bull country. You're either gonna do it over here again, or go do whatever you're gonna do. But you're not about to be, you're not about to take your degrees from another country and bring it here. My mom grew us, went to college again. If you ask my mama's story, I was the person, cause I was really like computer inclined. I used to type up her, her like thesis paper and stuff like I had no idea what she was like yo she called me junior because I'm I'm, I'm I'm the same name as my dad she was like could you just type up this is the paper for whatever whatever I don't know what I'm I just type it up because she would write it because you know she's older I would type it up I'm just typing it up and um honestly she became she graduated college and then had to go to another specialty to teach in school again she wasted eight years of her life over here to do the same thing she did back in jamaica just to try to get to where she was at she loved teaching the same thing as the son of educators academics naturally thrived academically 
He attributes this to his family's high expectations and his own ambition to succeed in life. Academics noted a stark contrast in the educational systems when he arrived in the U.S. He found American schools more relaxed and disciplined and focused, which was a stark contrast to the rigorous education that he was receiving in Jamaica. School is viewed so differently in other countries. So I, uh, you know, me and my brother growing up in Jamaica, you got grades, but you also got ranked. So it was known. So for example, if it's a class of 30 people, they used to clown the person who was the dumbest, who was the 30th of 30. Because they write it on your report card. You're the 30, you're the worst, you're the slowest in the class. Real talk. So, so they, they, they compare you against each other. By the way, that's something that doesn't exist in, in, in um, American high schools until you get to college, where they start grading on a curve. Uh -huh. Right, yeah. My mom, teacher, father, principal. I didn't know this. We had no life. All we did was just like, book work, book work, book work. Yeah. As a kid, that was just normal, though. We didn't know. So I come over to the U.S., and I remember like even uh, um, going to high school, and my mom was just always honest about grades, grades, grades. And it was just basically kind of like an overtone, like, yo, we're sending you to college to become, like, something esteemed. We want doctors and lawyers. And for any immigrants that listen to this, you'll know that feeling. Yeah. The family wants doctors, lawyers, dentists. So it became, yo, you got to be something. And that pressure is on. Rather than conforming to the more laid-back American school environment, academics double down on his academic work, determined to reach college and secure a skilled profession, which he would eventually do. He also said that he was shocked by how glamorized America was and was disappointed when he realized how it really was over here once he arrived. He said in an interview with DJ Vlad, As a child, the story of what the United States was was so glamorizing and it was so oversold to someone who came from a countryside in Jamaica that I thought when the plane took off from Jamaica, I thought we were gonna land on the clouds. They made it seem like heaven. I kid you not, I'm yeah. serious. So that was, that was the whole thing of, okay, great. So life is just better there. And my mom brought us over and, and we would stay with like my aunt who's a little more established. She had a husband at that time. When we, when we first came over to like live, we come during the winter time to like, you know, she had just like gotten through some citizenship since and stuff like, so she brought, she brought us over here. Now I remember getting off the plane at JFK and it was sleet. And it was, I've never been here in the, in the winter time. And it was probably, it, 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 it just told me that whatever you thought America was, ain't it. And when the plane, Landed, I said, what is this disgusting? And we pull up to where my mom is now staying with the guy she's seeing. And it's a two bedroom apartment in like a, it's, it's like a quadplex. So we have people living up top to the left. This whole time, going up. And it's two bedrooms and my mom, the guy she's with, my oldest brother and me and my, and my second brother. So I'm the youngest. Five people. Five people. Two bedrooms. Two bedrooms. And I'm like, I thought it was paradise. We lived in a house that was pretty big. Everybody had their own room. Mm -hmm. I come to the U.S., we're tripling up in one bed. I'm like, yo, what's going on? Ack arrived in the U.S. when he was in the seventh grade and says that he never really fit in with the rest of the kids. Now, growing up in New Jersey, he said it felt just like a small town, meaning that by the time he arrived, everybody already was clicked up making it hard for him to make any real friends. Either way, once he was done with high school, it was time to figure out what was next. He was living with his mom and two brothers at the time, still in that two bedroom apartment, except now everybody was grown. So sharing bedrooms and whatnot just didn't sound like a good idea. That's why when Act decided it was time for college, he refused to come home on their summer breaks. Life changed for me once, you know, on breaks in college, people would go back home. It was so uncomfortable at that point. You gotta remember, when I came here, I'm like, I'm like 10. Yeah. Now I'm like 18, man. I don't want to go like we, us three can't sleep in the same bedroom. Like it's not gonna work. Right. I'm 18, you 23. <laughs> he is like 32. I stop out of work. Like we grown men. So 
what I did, I said, yo, I made the decision. I said, I'm not going back home on the brakes. I said, I'm gonna make, I'm gonna figure it out. And and I was just determined. I was the first to move out of all my brothers and I was the youngest. It's it, it just like, I couldn't do no more. When it came time to pick a major, Ak said he only wanted a job that could land him $100,000 a year. After doing his research, he landed in biomathematics because basically any degree with the word math in it is gonna command a job that pays well. He decided to go with a college locally and enrolled at Rutgers University. Act looked at college as an investment. He knew he would be spending upwards of $100,000 for his degree and felt like it only made sense to major in something useful. In fact, I like DJ Academics' outlook on college. College is nothing more than an investment. You gotta start thinking about it like that. I see people graduating from college with a communications degree. And, and it's cool and all if you, you want to do communications, but I've seen so many people just graduate to graduate. They graduate with a sports science degree. Unless you really have some master plan of you becoming a like owning your own sports agency, and that's really what you want to do, why the would y'all go to college and pay up to $100,000 in tuition, like cumulatively, to go get a job that's going to give you 35000 a year? Trust me. When I went to college, and again, I refused to let my mom take loans out for me, because my mom, she's a mother to three boys, and my brother who went to college out of state, my, my older brother, my, he's the middle one, he, shit, she was taking loans for him, and it was like 40000 50000 and I saw my mom, my mom didn't make that a year. I felt guilty having her do the same, so if I could throw everything in my name, I wanted to, right? So I took the loans under my name, and the the thing I was saying is that I'm gonna have to set myself up to pay this shit back. I instantly made the decision that if I'm gonna stay four years at an institution, right? So from 18 to 22 or whatever the case is, if I'm gonna stay four years at an institution, trust and believe, and by the way, I stayed longer. Trust and believe I'm coming out of that joint making at least 100,000. So I say all that to say, don't go to college if you're just going to think you're getting the degree and you're just gonna get a bull degree, get a degree that could get you some paper. And if you're not thinking like that, that means you never went to scare the bag. Don't be the dumbass after you graduate who's working a job making 35 grand and your friend who didn't go to college, who's been in the job field for four more years than you is making 45 grand. College is a investment. And I don't know how y'all treat investments, but I need to get all my money back. I treat that, I say, yo, I ain't coming out of here with less than a, when I, when I graduate with a biomathematics degree, this YouTube, this DJ, this music, it never worked out, but I'm getting a hundred racks. That's facts. Yo, when Sally Mae, or whatever you borrow the money from start hitting you, they don't give a about you. Yo, I got a sports science degree. What? Where my bread at? I told y'all, Sally Mae called me one day, they were like, yo, when we gonna get this payment? I said, yo, bro. I said, I said, could you call me back? I'm at work. You know what they said? Man, stop playing. You don't got no job. I said, how you know that? <laughs> I didn't have no job. <laughs> I had no job. I don't know. How you know that? They were like, we know everything about you. You moved three times. We've been sending the letters to the right address every time. I'm like. But he says that with hindsight, in reality, his freshman year in college was the worst academic year of his life. After living under his mom's roof and being on a strict routine of schoolwork, he took this opportunity to really experience freedom for the first time and spent the majority of his nights partying. In fact, it was during his time at college that Act would begin to develop a few key traits that would eventually change the entire trajectory of his future. Act said that he needed something extracurricular to do at this time, but he wasn't athletic and he also wasn't interested in doing any big brand stuff. So out of boredom, he started to produce beats. He would then take these beats and send them out to rappers while he was trying to get placements, but at his own admission, it wasn't a fruitful venture for him. However, he was able to take the equipment that he had bought to produce beats and start using it for another purpose, DJing parties on campus. Him and his homies would set up parties and act would be on the turntables or, well, the DJ software on his computer. Some of the clips of these events still exist online today. He also started working at the college radio station, 90.3 The Core, which was a rock station, but he would play rap music, where he would talk with people about stuff happening around campus, and he even interviewed some underground artists from his area. You already know what it is, DJ Academics. Take care, party going down Thursday, December 1st, 9 o'clock. Court tap, it's going to be crazy. We'll be out there.
Shout out to Once again, Campus Invasion Radio. We got DJ Academics in the studio. Shout out to Mike Hardy also in the building. What up, bro? What's going on, bro? This evolved into a late night college radio show called Late Night Creep. We also turned this into a blog site where we would post random articles about things that happen in the entertainment industry. The blog later evolved into kind of like a world star hip hop site where Act would post videos and music from people, but it never did get a lot of traction. Most of the videos still sitting at around a few hundred views. However, it didn't last very long and he would eventually be kicked off the air. He says that he was kicked off because he would talk too much and wasn't playing enough music and continuously offered his opinion, which at times could be a bit controversial. The main reason he was kicked off though is because he played a dirty version of Big Sean's hit single Dance featuring Nicki Minaj and the FCC started tripping because the song basically just says ass, 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 ass a thousand times in a row. Before they managed to get him off the air though, he had started posting clips from inside the studio to his YouTube channel and was gaining a little traction over there, like 1,000 to 2,000 views per video, but traction nonetheless. So for the next 12 months, he would upload commentary videos to his channel as if he were still in the station, even though he had been kicked out. And he started engaging directly with his audience on YouTube. He relied on his hard-hitting commentary from the beginning. For example, on June 18, 2023, he uploaded a video where he gave a review of Kanye West's album Yeezus and decided that he wasn't going to pull any punches about how he felt. There's been a lot, a lot of social talk on social media about, especially the album. How good is the album? Is it worth buying? Is it trash? It's actually in stores today. In my opinion, Kanye West Yeezus is garbage. I can't give you credit for creativity. This is not kindergarten. I respect Kanye for how bold he is to actually take the risk with some of these songs and some of these tracks that's on this album, but some of them are just garbage, like complete garbage. So. What I really rate this whole album and all is that it has 10 tracks on it. So for me to break it down on what I would rate it, it's pretty easy. 10 tracks, um, three of them are just god awful, like unlistenable, like gave me a headache, gave me a migraine. Felt like every time I was listening to it, it felt like Miguel just jumped off the top rope and, and just gave me a leg drop. It was atrocious. None of those tracks I would ever want to listen again. This was really academic start on YouTube. From here, he actually went from zero to 100 pretty quick, but he had some learning to do along the way. For starters, he was making videos that were just a tad bit too long for the content that he was covering. For example, he made a video talking about the state of hip hop in New York. This video was 25 minutes long when it could have easily been 10 minutes. Act was quick to notice this too. He said when he started looking at his retention graph or how long people were watching his videos, he noticed to say a thousand people would initially click the video but out of those thousand people only three or four hundred would stick around and watch the rest of it with the other six or seven hundred falling off within the first 30 seconds noticing this deficiency ag said that he started to realize that his specific audience wasn't interested in long-form content they wanted the video about whatever the title said the video was about so he started to speed things up and treating the first 30 seconds of the video as the most critical part he would blaze through his intro and get right into the topic but on top of these rant like videos he was making act also started branching out into really his earliest forms of podcasting when he landed an interview with charlamagne the guy from the breakfast club how'd you get your name because i was reading that like you had a you had a nickname of that you used to give to the fiends yeah when i used to be out hustling you know rest in peace to my man a rap jarell we used to be hustling on his spot and like fiends would come up and Mount Scorn is a small town, population less than 8,000. And the black community is probably even smaller. So I used to always tell the fiends my name was Charles or Charlie. Yeah. Because I didn't want them to go tell my pops, yo, you know, your son back there hustling, whatever, whatever. Because I was young, so a lot of people didn't really make the connection, oh, that's Larry's son. So I used to always say my name was Charlie. And then when I started going to night school, I was just reading up on a, um, reading on a, in a history book, and I came across Charlemagne. And, and Charlemagne was French for Charles the Great. And the name of his empire was the Carolinian Dynasty. And I just was like, oh, Carolina, Carolinian, Charles the Great. I was like, Charlemagne, I'm gonna start calling myself Charlemagne. And when I started studying the 5% teachings of Islam, I was like, yeah, I'm gonna start calling myself the God, Charlemagne the God. 
from here, he did a few more interviews before deciding in October of 2013 that he was going to start his very own podcast. The name of this podcast was Creep Life, in line with the late night creep website that he had been building for years at this point. He would later change the name of this podcast to Reality Check, but this shows one, how ahead of the curve DJ Academics was in terms of digital media, and two, how dedicated he was to building his audience and influence. Podcasts really didn't start to take off until 2014, meaning Act was one of the first in the space online. It's your boy DJ Academics, and I'm here to bring you the Creep Life Podcast. Yep, you guys have been hitting me up, hitting up Late Night Creep, and from everything I've seen and from what I've heard, seems like you guys really want me to give you a podcast. So, here it is, and I do plan to continue this on a regular basis, pending your support. So, if you guys are listening, I want to make sure you guys are commenting, liking, and sharing this. We're going to be pretty much talking about anything within the hip-hop culture, but that doesn't exclude sports or anything that's also being talked about by, and I'll just sum it up as Black Twitter. So, However, after only five episodes of the podcast, academics decided to hang it up on that idea, probably because it just wasn't very successful for him, with each episode only getting around 5,000 views. So he kept it pushing with more rap news commentary, but within six months of him shutting down that podcast, DJ Academics would strike gold in the online media world when he pivoted his content and started to cover more shocking news. See, at the time, there was a new wave of music coming out of the city of Chicago. This new style of music was dubbed drill music. Now, most of y'all are familiar with what drill music is, but for those who aren't, drill music is basically rappers chronicling crimes that they either know about or have been involved in. Most of the time, violent crimes. In Chicago, there was a whole wave of rappers like Lil Durk, King Louie, and later people like King Vine. They would rap about killing their ops, name drop dead people in songs, and just be the most disrespectful that they could be. The thing was, most of these rappers in their songs were actually being linked back to real crimes by news stations, and DJ Academics took note. He covered these rappers on his main channel, people like Lil Reese and Fredo Santana, but noticed that a big portion of his audience over there didn't know who these people were. They knew who Keith was, but not the other smaller rappers from the area. But the people who did know who they were were asking for more. So he started a new channel on June 24, 2014, called The War in Chirac, and uploaded his first video only two days later on June 26. The video was about Chief Keith getting robbed, and the video was only about five minutes long instead of the usual 10 to 20 minutes that his videos normally ran. It was short and to the point. He also took an odd stance on how he covered what was happening in Chicago by deciding to report it with satire infused in the whole thing. And when I created that, I was trying to figure out how do I cover hip hop in this realm because a lot of the things I didn't like, I was mortified by. And I said, the only appropriate way is to, I have to, I did it with satire. And for me, the hope was to make people see how ridiculous this was. He also did something else that he would become infamous for in this video when, even in the first video, he gave a nickname to the rapper he was covering by calling Chief Keef the Baphomet of Chicago. Check out some of the highlights from this first video. It's your boy DJ Academics, and now, as the Chirac Civil War wages on, and let me get my in order. Let me see. We have a neat named Boss Top who was Chief Keef's protege. He was supposed to be the protege savage to Baphomet. Now, I'm not sure why these two fools fell out, but it wouldn't surprise me if it was over some maybe some Reggie, maybe some sneakers. And you know my favorite reason for girls to start beefing in Chirac sneak dissing or it might have been over someone it apparently might have been over some song titles or something about something to do with another neat named od who died who influenced the whole name of block aka o block but now he even has a hit song on youtube called what else 30 choppers sounds like a who goes to sunday school every week and probably leads the church in prayer every week before communion right mm -hmm. allegedly boss top and his robbed Chief Keith and another GB member called Capo for their chains, including this notable Jesus piece that Capo owns. Now, which is ironic because the 
who celebrate a lot of fuckery with their demonic lyrics and vibes, they're rocking Jesus pieces. Ain't that a Now, I didn't think this was true at first because I'm thinking, robberies? Robberies don't go down in Chirac. Only murders. This was a significant moment in Act's career, and this video did over 100,000 views, sending Act a strong signal that people wanted more, so he continued with his coverage. On March 9th, DJ Academics dropped his first 1 million view video when he covered the arrest of Rondo No. 9, a drill rapper from Chicago who basically told on himself for murder on Twitter. <sighs> it's your boy DJ Academics, and when did dumb get dumber? Rondo No. 9, I just did a story about this when getting arrested for murder. Now while browsing through this idiot's Twitter page, it became quite obvious why he's arrested. He's arrested not only because cops have fingerprints of him, caught him on video committing the crime, this idiot is also on Twitter snitching on himself. Now look at these tweets on your screen. Last time I talked about him having a rocket launcher, people accused me of snitching on him. Now this is allegedly committed murder. And look at the tweet that was tweeted out on the same day of the murder. Now cops are alleging that this murder went down on February 22nd. And now all these tweets I'm showing you guys are on February 22nd. Rondo number nine was eventually convicted of the crime and sentenced to 39 years in prison where he still sits till this day. Then he got another taste of virality when he dropped a video about Lil Dirt getting choked out by Lil Reese. They did over 2 million views only a few weeks after that first one. Did Lil Dirk get choked out? Choked the f out by Lil Reese. Now, Lil Dirk said, no. How the f does the, sec how the f does the Secretary of Defense of Chirac get choked out by Lil Reese? The five-star war general himself, how the hell you get choked out by Lil, Lil Reese? So come on now. He addressed this by putting up some type of video on Instagram, man. Uh, listen to him address it right here. Apparently, he has some new song coming out. Listen to it. What is this wrong with Ella? I'm loving the niggas, cause niggas a joke. I catch another case, you think it's a joke. She gonna say, Kanye, I'll stop with those people. Now, I don't know what the little dirt just said because we know Chirac savages tend to have their own mumbling dialect, so I'm still trying to interpret it, but the little that I got. Lil Durk said, f*** out of here with all these choke out rumors. Now, you're probably wondering where the f*** did this whole rumor come from? And I was wondering that too, because everybody keeps asking me, who, who, who choked who out? I'm like, how the f*** would I know? I'm, I'm, I'm not monitoring ne necks. How the hell would I know if somebody got choked out? I'm, I don't have a neck monitor like, oh, did, did, did you get choked out today? No, I don't know. I don't know. But apparently, and just with some research, apparently, this is what all the with the are saying. And one person that everyone keeps pointing to is a guy named Crump. Now, I have no idea who this Crump guy is, but apparently he's like the Anderson Cooper of the hood. He always know who's choking the f out of who, which savages are caught lacking, who was always, he always know whatever the f is going on. Apparently, people get from his timeline sent it to me, and I'm like, wow, I guess this guy really is plugged in with what the f is going on. Now, he saw little Reese's, the Grim Reaper's choke of death on Lil Durk's neck. Well, I'm not even sure what prayer, if this did happen, I'm not sure what kind of prayer Lil Durk said to, because if the Grim Reaper has his hand around your neck, I think, I think it's, it's about be death. In total, Academics has made 526 videos on this channel and gained almost 400,000 subscribers, racking up almost 150 million views in the process on this one channel alone. It's safe to say that this series changed Axe's financial life for sure. Despite receiving a ton of criticism for his coverage though, people in Chicago eventually started to accept Axe and his coverage, with Lil Reese even naming one of his albums, The Grim Reaper, a nickname that Academics is solely responsible for giving him, and Lil Durk has even sat down and done podcasts with Act in the recent past. In fact, Act said in an interview with DJ Vlad that the whole reason he started the war in Chirac was because he made videos about Lil Durk and others from the area that were popular, and people in the comments would say, hey bro, if you're gonna cover Lil Durk, you gotta cover Lil J too. You gotta cover the whole thing. The war in Chirac, let me put it out, let me state it on the record. The war in Chirac was built, or the page was created because of Little J. Let me say again, the war in Chirac was created because of Little J. Let me explain. 
I was covering Keith, Dirk, and Reese on my main channel with three times as much subscribers doing what they were doing. They went mainstream. Everybody started hitting me to say, there's two sides, at least covering it. Started when people said, act, you gotta cover the other people that are getting dissed because they're responding. And I said, well, who are these people responding? They're naming Lil J, they named the other people too, because Keith and them were dissing people. And I'm like, bro, do these guys have a hit? Nah, they don't got a hit. Are they like super relevant? Nah, they ain't super relevant. But they treat. Yo, I'm running a newspaper. I've always looked at my career like that. I'm running a newspaper. We care about Chief Keith. Why would we care about the that Chief Keith's beefing with? They were like, nah, but that's not fair. That's why I've seen the comments a lot every time I did Keith videos. So you know what I said? Go back to every interview I've ever done about the war Chirac and why I did it. I said, you know what? I'm going to treat this like a newspaper. I got my main channel over there. I'm going to create something and I'm going to cover the like, I'm gonna cover the responses of who ain't as popular as Keith that responds. Or the who is doing Instagram that's responding. The person who I first really focused on was Lil J. And when Lil J was asked if he thought DJ Academics played a part in what was happening in Chicago, here's what he had to say. Now, Academics gave you the name Wolverine. Uh, what you think about Academics? Like, cause a lot of people give him a hard time about the war in Chirac claiming that he instigated beefs and stuff like that. He wasn't instigating that. He was telling, he was just telling what he saw. You feel me? The motherfuckers be telling on themselves on the internet. He ain't doing nothing but putting that shit together and putting that shit out there. It ain't, it ain't like he making this shit up. Motherfuckers put that shit on the internet. These goofy, how he instigate something, you goofy motherfuckers on the internet. He ain't doing nothing, making some money off it. I salute him for it, you know? Yeah, you know, people make it seem like because he was reporting the news, it uh, it increased the murder rate in Chicago. It Damn made it a competition. Wow. People dying and motherfucking game banging out here increased that because he doing how the fuck is that that don't influence motherfucking motherf in the streets for real. You let the internet influence you, yo ass not a street. Oh no. But when asked if he would ever do the war in Chirac again and cover the same topics again if he could go back in time, Act seems to have developed a better understanding of the whole situation that he was covering. If you could go back in time, would you make Warren Chirac again? You know, you know, I've grown, was it appropriate? Probably wouldn't do that again. I wouldn't do it again just because um, I think we're dealing with mental illness in Chicago. And when you see people are kids, these people who are doing murders, like Rondo number nine was like 17, doing drills and all that type. Of, it's easy to be outraged and also say, damn, how could you guys take a life so easily? But also you got to think about the cycle of mental issues that they're having, the trauma that they're suppressing. But to say that everything that Ack has built came off of the back of his War in Chirac series would be incorrect. While it did work to propel him forward a bit, the truth is Academics was popping on his main channel, covering mainstream rappers without the War in Chirac series. In addition to these two channels, Ack started to branch out into other channels as well. A good example of this is his Crime Fails channel that was made in 2014 where he would basically react to people being arrested and snitching on themselves. He only made three videos on this channel in total, but with only those three uploads, he gained over 10,000 subscribers with each video doing about 40,000 views. To be honest, if he kept working on that channel, he probably would have been successful with it alone. But from here, DJ Academics went crazy online, making numerous channels to post content to, one of which was his DJ Academics channel, which currently sits at around 3 million subscribers. Plus, his DJ Academics TV channel, where he would basically post Instagram live videos from artists with no commentary from him, DJ Academics TV 2, and a live streaming channel called King Academics. On his live streaming channel, the idea was to play his favorite video games and monetize his viewership even further. After a few months of making videos like this, Academics noticed that there was a gap in the market on another platform that we all know as Twitch. He recognized that really no hip hop YouTubers were on the platform, so he made his official Twitch channel and started streaming there, and then taking those clips from Twitch and posting them over on YouTube. This is something that a lot of Twitch streamers do nowadays, mostly because of Twitch is terrible discoverability algorithm and also because it opens up a new revenue source and a new place to get fans but 
academics was one of the first to use this stream on twitch and then clip it out on a youtube channel method 2015 was kind of a big year for act this is the year where things really took off for him in terms of viewership see this is where the beef brewing between drake and meek mill had started and academics made sure that he was the go-to guy for all of the information he was the de facto person on twitter that people went to for updates causing his tweets to go viral again and again and again for the first time ever he was going viral himself not just the content and the people that he was covering this led to him racking up over a million followers on twitter pretty much around like 2014 2015 what really i think broke me was the the meek mill versus drake beef hmm okay i was the number one person on twitter that everybody listened to for and this was true to like my nature and how i like to cover stuff if drake had a slick line like yo i was playing my music above you blah blah blah, blah. like i'm gonna get that reference it's kind of what genius does but yeah. i would like kind of explain it because a lot of stuff would go up people's heads and fans just wanted more info so everyone would just come to me and i i hit a million followers that However, it wasn't all uphill for him because the same year, DJ Academic's main channel on YouTube was suspended after he uploaded a video reviewing Meat Mill's album, Dreams Are Worth More Than Nightmares. It's DJ Academics and check it out because you guys always ask me this one particular question and it's why don't you just stick with one account? Why do you have multiple accounts? Now, the reason why I have multiple accounts is for a day like today. Now, I put out so much content per day, not every week, per day. I put out so much content that if YouTube ever suspended me or anything ever happened with YouTube with one particular account, I got another account which I could still put out material, okay? First I started getting a backup channel and then other channels kind of sprung out of that. Now, exactly today, I put up a, and this is on my second channel, this is the main, there's a second channel though, right? I put up a review of Meek Mill's Dreams Worth More Than Nightmare and now like an hour or two hours after it was up, my channel just went bye bye, it just got deleted. Now, I don't know exactly what the case is. Usually YouTube gives us a lot of information. I have a couple of people I work with in the background, also a couple of companies. They're usually checking on to make sure everything's cool. But for whatever reason, this time around, it was a little bit different. Now, because of that, I will not be uploading to this channel either because we're figuring out why my account got deleted. What I'm gonna do, I'm gonna make a new channel. And this is gonna be my new second channel. It's gonna have all the material for the last couple of weeks on it. And it's gonna be my new backup, okay? I will not be posting to this channel until it gets sorted out. I have no idea why YouTube deleted it or uh, suspended it, that's what they're calling it. And you, we're gonna find out more in the coming weeks or coming days. Now, academics never did post to this channel again but Axe spent the next few years covering hip hop topics on his other various channels and built up a pretty good amount of influence in that time, garnering millions of views. But the next gigantic step for Axe was actually when he kind of stepped away from his channels and took a job in traditional media with Complex News Network. Complex had been making a huge push to move away from traditional print media to digital media, and one of the first things they did was reach out to Act. They pitched him an idea for a show, and it was simple. There will be three hosts, one who would sit in the middle on topics, one who would lean towards the younger generation's viewpoints on hip hop, and one who would lean towards the older generation's viewpoints on hip hop. The two other co-hosts were Nadeska, who worked at Complex already, and Joe Budden, who was becoming his own kind of influencer for hip hop online. It was a great idea, and Act knew it, and the chemistry between him and Joe was apparent from the very start. So he agreed to work for Complex and came to work every day for everyday struggle for over a hundred episodes, but it wasn't all smooth selling. Now that Act was in real life media, he started to see himself talking with and interviewing rappers that he had covered on his YouTube channel in the past, and this made for some really heated moments on everyday struggle. The first time that this happened was when they invited Chicago rapper Vic Mensa to the show. Vic wasn't a fan of Academic's previous coverage of what had happened in Chicago, resulting in this moment right here. I don't care enough about the cover to discuss it further. Yeah. All right. All right, and we're done here. <laughs> you want to move on to yeah. to do some news with us, right? Yeah. Excellent. All right, so we've been talking about XXX Tentacion a lot and his crazy stage. Oh, actually, I hate to backpedal. I'm sorry. I did want to ask you about. <laughs> what, I'm sorry. That's what, okay. Joe usually does. What this. do you think about the state of Chicago rap these days? Chicago rap. Um. You know, I think we always got pioneers in Chicago. We've had a lot of different, um, a lot of different waves. 
And uh, I'm excited to see, and kind of waiting to see if there's a new, if, there, if there's a new thing coming out of Chicago. But you know, I'm, like a new I'm movement? off. Like some new artists. You felt you were a little bit repulsed by the fact that so many people outside the culture of Chicago, they, were, they hyped up the music, not knowing that real lives were being affected, deaths and other type of madness happened within the music. And the music was a real life depiction of that. Like, how did you, how did you feel about that? I, I wanted to slap you in your face, yeah. honestly. And Ooh. I'm just seeing you here. So I'm like, this is a tame environment. So I would keep it to my words. But I really felt as if people exactly like you sensationalized and and made a following off of clowning situations that we go through in real life. And I, I think, you know, they had no right. You know, you specifically, like you ain't never have a right. Like whatever made you feel like you had a, a space to have a perspective on our people dying on a daily basis. I, I, I really, I really think you were because- In what, what sense? Because there's a video that that you put up about a person named Trey 57 making all these jokes. Oh, here's another Chirac Savage. Like, this guy's stupid. He messed with the Grim Reaper. Like, this is not a video game. That's I grew up with. I've known since I was five years old. And to see you come on the internet and, like, with this corny-ass little voice and make jokes about it. Like, you know, I was waiting to see you. And it's a couple people waiting to see you. I heard you say you didn't want to come to Chicago when I sat down, because you clearly don't, because you no, really no, couldn't even stand outside. You really built a following off of clowning our deaths, people that I really know. And you know what's up about it and why I said the things I said to you is because were we to be in a room, there's no cameras, there's no security, you see us, you wouldn't make no jokes. You wouldn't make a single joke. But the reason this show worked was because of both hosts. Joe was no stranger to making comments about people online either, and only a few weeks after the incident with Vic Mensa, Act found himself in another sticky situation when him and Joe were interviewing the Migos at an award show. See, Joe wasn't a fan of basically modern day hip hop in the sound and was real outspoken about it. He had made remarks about the Migos and their label QC in the past, so when they all ran into each other, tension was already high, but somehow they still secured the interview with the Migos, leading to this iconic moment where DJ Academics asked Takeoff from the Migos how it felt to be left off of his song bad and bougie. Now obviously, it was the tension between Joe and the Migos that caused this situation to end so badly, but it was something about Act asking over and over how Takeoff felt about being left off of bad and bougie that was just hilarious. Mac explained this later in a live stream that he did. The whole Migo, despite what you think, and uh, listen, by tomorrow everything should be clear, but that's not a, what y'all seen on video, that one minute clip, disregard my questions, disregard me saying what or whatever, literally couldn't hear, only idiots really thought I was trying to play takeoff. I'm sitting on the opposite end, it's six of us on, on set. Everybody shouting, it's a red carpet, it's the first time I've been there, but everybody shouting, can't hear, no no earpiece. Takeoff, It. first of all, I'm trained in mumble rap. I don't know if y'all know, I'm trained in mumble rap. I could understand takeoff, okay? All that, I type it, I could understand it, right? Because I'm trained in that. But he speaks slow. I can't really hear him. So I ask him a question. Truth be told, he says, I didn't hear him the first two times. And then I hear him say, does it look like I was left off bad and bougie? And no lie, I had to think about it. I'm like, wait, I'm like, was that Uzi or was it takeoff? I'm pretty sure he wasn't on a joint. But that's not what set these guys off. It was a whole chain of events from that day. QC was not with us. The Migos came there with energy already because QC isn't with us, okay? Is it me particularly? No, but we do a show. They're not with a show like that. So when they come up there, you know what I mean? Just trying to get a little dap and all that. They ain't, they ain't with it, they ain't with it. They ain't with it, that's clear. Also, there was, you know what I mean, some situations that happened before. Hopefully everything comes to light. This with amigos, they were looking for a reason. The questions didn't bother them. As soon as they see the mic drop, they're like, all right, trying to disrespect, what's up? We've been looking for a reason. The amigos pull up. I'm like, oh, yes. You know how long we've been trying to get amigos in the studio? We've been talking about them the whole time. We've been talking about QC, talking about Yachty. Great. 
they come up and I'm like dapping them up. Yo, what's up, yo, yo, what's up? Yo, what's up? Yo, take off. I'm dapping them up. I'm like, oh man, this is great. They all look at Joe and he reaches out for his hand and they look at it like it, they all look at him like this. I think he daps himself up like, okay then. <laughs> Two minutes into the interview, P walks in and like grabs Joe by here and like, like give him like an aggressive massage like, Remember that convo we had, right? And I'm like, what the fuck are they talking about? Now, that was actually, he was trying to remind him that, <laughs> this sounds so random, the day before, is the day before we had the award show, Joe went to like some f store in the mall to get socks. You know what I mean? And he goes to get socks, and in the socks aisle, is the ghost people. So QC is in the socks aisle and they're probably saying, no way, the guy who, because Joe's rhetoric at the time, whenever he was talking about trash rappers, he would use it interchangeable with Yachty. And so they're looking like, in no way, Joe Bun, the guy who been talking trash about our artists is right here. So I guess they had a conversation with him. I, I don't think it was too crazy, but it was just like, yo, like, we don't like it. What are you doing? And I think he was just saying, hey, listen, I don't know too many of these new rappers. I don't mean to use him as the de facto rapper for trash rapper. I I, I, I just kind of switch him, switch him out. It's, it's not malicious, right? They basically said, listen, well, we don't like it. Could you stop? And he's like, well, if, if that's the only issue, like I'm still gonna have my pain, but fine. I'm, I'm gonna make sure I cognizantly don't make it seem like Yachty's just a trash rapper when I'm just trying to use those terms of colloquials. So that's what P came on set to be like, yo, remember that conversation now? We're doing an interview now. Man, I got a million questions, sir. I asked him, I said, yo, yo, uh, Takeoff, um, how do you feel about you not being on, on the biggest song, Bad and Bougie? And, and, and the funny part about it, every time it would answer me, it looked like he was about to shout. Like, he would be like, and then he would just whisper. So that's what I'm like, wait, what? what? So this was super organic. Joe as well is, is is like I could tell he 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 doesn't like the energy. So if you look how he's sitting the whole time, he's his back is facing me in the desk and he's facing them. After like five minutes, Joe is done with them because he kind of feel like they're playing the two cool for school. He's not feeling the energy. He don't really want to be there. And he says, "Yo, just wrap this up, right?" Also, to give him some credit, there was a producer there who was giving the wrap up sign. My wrap up was asking an additional question, which was gonna lead to the wrap up. Joe couldn't even wait. He says, F this shit. gets up, throws the mic, walks the f off. The whole Migos entourage just formed like Voltron. And then th they basically just start jumping out of the, the woodworks like wild hyenas, you get me? <laughs> By the way, nobody touched Joe. Obviously, nothing ever came of this, and the two went on to make a bunch of episodes of Everyday Struggle together, but there were cracks in the foundation that were starting to show. The first thing that led to the downfall of this show was Joe Budden deciding that he was going to leave. There were various reasons why, but one of the biggest issues was money. Joe said that they were integrating sponsors into the show, but not compensating him and act properly for the ad placements. Then, he said that they started to change the format. The show didn't start with guests coming on to talk. That came after the first few episodes, and Joe wasn't a big fan of the move. After nine months of Ack and Joe recording the show, Complex issued a statement to Billboard.com that said Joe Budden is not continuing as a host on Everyday Struggle in 2018. The show will be back in the new year with all new episodes and guests. We wish Joe all the best and thank him for a great 2017. We love and respect him. We believe he's terrific, but the reality is we couldn't reach an agreement. This separation between Joe and Everyday Struggle came after only nine months of employment. What it quickly became was the best hip hop show ever, in my opinion, I'm biased. <laughs> I don't think ever before in hip hop, there has been a show where they just giving it up like that. And I, I, I do credit that to act as well. That dynamic between the three of us on that screen does not exist without everybody playing a part. They come to us and they say, Nike has Vapor Max sneakers and we're doing a sponsor integration or some shit. We need you to wear this. My business mind told me I knew better than that. I wore it anyway. That's a check, people. And it's not a small check. It is a rather large check. Complex solicits rather large checks. Do they share with the creators? No. 
Fast forward, Spotify calls them. They want us to talk about a rap caviar playlist. They want to insert topics for me to speak about candid under the guise of it being candid for no money or very little money. As the creator of this show, that's a problem. So Joe says, no. Know what they said? you joe we'll do it without you know what spotify said sorry complex no you won't i'm telling you about a company that has now damaged a relationship with one of the top three streaming providers i cannot create a show and you sell the properties of that show without cutting a slice to the that make that show possible i did not build and create this show to talk to guests every day i hate guests now that i'm unemployed allow me to speak freely i hate all of you every last one complex slash verizon though in month one month two when they see the numbers because these people are so numbers based and focused on algorithms i don't check the numbers for this podcast know how i know it's moving impact I thought the complex would recognize what academics and myself as outside entities and vendors have done for that conglomerate. And at the end of the contract, they would show that they have appreciated the best year that they have ever had. Once Joe left, the show really started to struggle every day, despite them bringing in a new co-host and academics knew it too. Oh yeah, I'm talking about everyday show. I could adjust that quick. Everyday struggle been super trash for, since we rebooted it. Um, you could call it chemistry, you could call it whatever. It's been super trash. I can't watch the episodes. Thank y'all for for y'all who, who do watch the episode. Them shit is trash. I ain't gonna lie to you. I can't even put them shit on my. If you notice, I don't even tweet that. Shit. I don't even put it on my Instagram though. Them shit is garbage. <laughs> I know good content when I see. Them shit is garbage. Okay. Uh, that's just being, being being honest, being factual. Um, uh, again, that's why, I mean, for me, the emphasis has been on my Twitch, on my own personal YouTube and all, all that shit. But the show right now is not clicking on 800%. That's just being factual. Now, it's, it's two weeks into um, trying a new host. This is what it is. But it just ain't clicking. It's trash. <laughs> I don't got to keep it on with y'all, man. The same way I could be objective about other people, I could be objective about some shit I got to do with me. Um, if you look at me most time on there, I'm like, I know this trash, bro. <laughs> um, anything else I, I won't address, maybe at a later date, a later time. And that later time would come. After the second co-host got the boot, they brought in a third co-host named Wayno. Now, if you ask me, this is where the show really did kind of shake back a little bit, as Wayno did a really good job of keeping people entertained with that, but it never did hit the same after Joe left. So much so that Complex was ready to move the show off of their channel and onto another one, and they wanted it to go on Academics page, but he could see the inevitable failure coming, so he declined. I could tell you off the rip like the first two weeks because you know what i mean it, it it took like i forgot how long for the views to get right they were like hey could we throw everyday struggle on your channel i said no no we cannot my channel don't uh and, and offer me 40 grand to put some shit on my channel i told him no we don't put nothing on my channel nothing that academics don't solely bring some his heart i don't care what the check is that's why all my videos do 200 plus. I don't do nothing on that channel. For, there's no money you could give me for that. And you ain't, you know, I said, y'all the platform, y'all figure this shit out. You get me? When you, when you, when you sell that um, right or that opportunity to be on your shit, you don't matter. You know what I mean? When, when they could buy you, you don't matter. When they could control you, you don't matter. He also took to a live stream and basically confirmed what Joe was saying about the sponsorships for the show. He basically breaks down how a deal that they had with Microsoft worked and how that money was allocated inside a complex and how little of it he received. The reason why Everyday Struggle didn't work, when we were with Complex, Complex gave us a, a, a standard bump. So if we had an ad that month, you got to add a certain amount of money to your deal or, or to your invoice. 
So it, say we're getting paid, I'm making this up, $20. If we had an ad, you could add 15 more dollars. So if we had any ad, if we had one ad or we had 1,500 ads, you add 15 bucks to your $20. You're guaranteed 20, you add 15 bucks. So we would get 35 bucks, right? Where everyday struggle fell apart, Joe Budden was just like, well, y'all are charging really premium rates because we have a really hot show. So, so, you know, he found out that they were signing ad deals for millions of dollars. We weren't even getting 100,000 overall when it came to like all the ads. So they're getting 95% of the money that's coming in for the ads. Granted, this, and, and this is where Complex kind of, but also, you know, Joe was wilding out too. The way to solve it is, is this right here. Give a percentage of the ad revenue, right? Which means if, my bookie comes in, Blue Chew comes in, whatever comes in says, yo, we got 100,000 for like five episodes or let's just, let's say 20 episodes, 20 episodes of y'all reading these ads for whatever, whatever. Okay, cool. It's 100,000 to the podcast. Now, unfortunately, and I learned this with dealing with bigger corporations, 100,000 isn't 100,000, which by the way, Bob Menery is sounding a lot like Rory and Millie Maul because he doesn't have the books, clearly. Like he, you know, he's talking about money, but he, he hasn't seen the books. When $100,000 comes in, say for 20 episodes, it's not, you're not deserved 70% or, or no, you're not deserved 30%, which uh, $100,000 would be 30,000. 30, According to the contract, that's what you, what you would think. I, th there was a deal that came into Complex of $2 million. When I, when I did On The Sticks, $2 million Xbox signed on for. I'm like, my percentage on the, on the thing was like, and I'll tell you now, it's like 40, 45%. They had 55, I had like 45. I'm like, I'm getting a milli. This shit's gonna be lit. I'm like, yo, I just made this up off my Twitch. I'm about to get a million dollars. What's up? It's litty, bro. I'm gonna give you how the business down because I don't really don't think it should be weird. And it, the reason why these things keep happening is lack of education. I try to give you education in everything I do. Okay, cool. The money comes in. What happens is the money is allocated at per the the company. I'm gonna give you another thing, right? When ad money comes in, usually it's not just net, or it's not it's not just gross. You're getting thirty percent off. It's usually net, so the money will come in. It'll pay for certain things. It'll be allocated a certain way. Like for example, I remember having the arguments about Complex. So two million dollars came in. It was two point one actually from Xbox, Microsoft. I'm like, all right, bet they can. It, it, they, I was on the calls with them. Like I'm going through everything. That's a big deal. We're about to go crazy. Later on, I'm, I'm just wondering what, where my $1 million is at. Now, I ain't getting the $1 million. What happened? Then we started doing the business. And this is the reason why it's good for y'all to be independent creators. Stop running to companies if y'all think that these deals means you're going to get a lot of money. Because there's always some other shit, right? Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that's what happened in here, but I'll give you the complex game. Two million comes in. This is what they do. They earmark. Any deal that comes in the complex via their sales team, you have to buy ads on their website have to like so they're gonna put part of the deal to the website them didn't want the website they wanted academic show but of course now four hundred thousand to the website hmm? okay well if you're buying into complex networks you gotta throw the sneaker shopping and hot ones so six hundred thousand or seven hundred thousand for both of those wait wait what wait hold on wait them wasn't on the... here's the point what i'm trying to tell you by the time they they tell you what's allocated to your show, granted, your show sold the deal. But you got to remember, they're complex. They don't only make money from you. They make money from everybody. So they cut that money up that came in and they put it to every mother person. 200000 to you, 400000 for the website, this, that, there, this, that, there. Because we had an account in. And I had an account. With, that's why I never said complex robbed me. You, don't, you can't tell them where to put the money. In the contracts they signed, they're going to say, yo, for... You have to buy this amount of advertising with blah, blah, blah. And they did it. So at the end of the day, my show probably only got like half a million, maybe 600,000. 600,000 of funding out of $2 million, which I thought was a $2 million deal. When you see the books, you figure out what it is. You'd be like, what? I know it's 2.1. What the? F oh, no, that went to 400, went to website, 600 went over there, this went to there. This went to just like, you know, banner ads. Like, you're like, what the f Now you're working with 
that for the show. Now when it comes to the show, here's the ghost. Remember, it's not gross, it's net. So you get four, you get six hundred thousand for the show. When they're done paying for production, they're done paying your talent fee. They pay your producers. They pay editing. Basically, they like remember everything comes to complex, so it don't matter. It's in their benefit to say, oh, we only profited about seventy thousand dollars. Oh, you could get your 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 cut off of the seventy thousand. You're like, what the? What about the two point one million? No. You get your cut off the 70000 what was allocated to your show. And then after we took every expense out of it, there's only 70000 in profit. Granted, everything is profit for them. Everything. Everything is profit for them because the, the, the ads on the website is profit for them. That's how it goes. Everything is profit for them. But what do you get? You only get what comes to on the sticks. So I'm looking at it, I'm like, so you're telling me from the big ass deal we got, y'all only allocated this to my show. And then not only that, when y'all done paying everybody, cause now we doing these expensive sets and we renting, just blowing through money. I think we had wasted like maybe 50 grand one time. We booked some, we booked some to do an episode with the was the was in New York while we was in Atlanta. Like it was just waste of money. So they come to you and be like, well, yeah, out of all that, for the season, yeah, your cut is 30000 So after two years of academics doing everyday struggle without Joe, the show was eventually ended for all of the previous reasons stated, but also because academics really just outgrew Complex. He was bigger than their whole platform and was really limiting himself to that show. Granted, he was still making his own content, but it's not like going to everyday struggle wasn't eating up valuable time. Not only that, but Complex seemed to develop a problem with academics being academics. He's always wrapped up in some kind of drama with people and he never really backs down. And sometimes this has resulted in him hurling insults towards whoever he's beefing with. A good example of this was when he got into it with Chrissy Teigen, a supermodel and wife to John Legend. Act did what Act normally does and went online to call Teigen out. Bigger Love sells 26K first week. It's bewildering to me. He his be talking match. I'm like, what's, what's, I, I dislike this so much. I can't even lie to you. Um, Chrissy Teigen Instagram. I, I just feel like yo, she actually one time she sneaked this to me. So f that straight up. And John Legend can hear that. Don't have your this to me because I don't give two f about none of y'all. How about you take that fucking big mouth of yours and that fucking weird looking face and start promoting your man's album? Maybe you wouldn't do twenty five thousand first week because you got all the jokes and when you're trying to get it you think you're the smartest cutest funniest thing possible but your man is still fucking flopping he's a legend doing 25,000 that's a fucking flop Christian Teigen suck after this incident Act went back online to apologize for his actions the thing was this apology clearly was pushed on Act heavy by the higher ups at Complex and it's one of the only times we've ever seen Act take back things that he said online not only did they force the apology, but they also suspended Act from their network for two weeks. And someone who, um, you know, tries to stick to my point and I'm opinionated. I do think, you know, as I, I believe even Wayne brought it up before. And I think even Deska doubled down on it. It was like, do you think you ever like crossed the line? I definitely want to, you know, start off by kind of like apologizing um, for some of the stuff that, you know, has been going on outside of the show. And it, in particular, you know, um, you know, while I'm defending myself versus rapper A, rapper B, all these other people, you know, I, I think I definitely went over the line when um, I was, you know, addressing a few women. And I just felt that just, that just wasn't right. You know, just after thinking about it, uh, like even seeing the clip, it looks nasty. And truth be told, uh, given everything that's going on, not only in the world, you know, given what's going on with, you know, um, you know, uh, the current climate of, you know, at Complex and also, you know, former employees and current employees. Also working with a desk as someone who, you know, I have a lot of love for, you know, I just felt it was, uh, it was just completely out of pocket and something that I had to, you know, admit that, yo, you can't be a hypocrite saying you're going to be an ally and stand for, you know, um, uh, riding for causes that, you know, matter to like people like your co-host Adeska and then, you know, do these other things or say these other things. So, you know, I want to, officially offer offer an apology and you know i've also spoke to complex leadership about it you know and they as well agree that you know it was out of pocket so 
I'm extending my, extend my apology to not only the Desca, but anyone who may have been offended. And, you know, with that being said, I think um, what's necessary is, you know, we, got, we have to have some type of action. And, you know, uh, I talked to Complex, you know, leadership, and, you know, I'm going to be taking the next two episodes off. Um, they agree with it. I agree with it. And when we do come back from our break, so there is going to be a break, you know, there's going to be two episodes without me. So I just wanted to apologize sooner before, you know, just kind of letting it lie because, you know, that would be the easy, the path of least resistance and just the easy way to go out. But we can't, we can't address things like this, like suckers, you know what I mean? So I want to apologize to everyone. And again, um, you guys will see me. You're going to have two episodes without me, but I just officially want to put my apology on it. All of this culminated in the show ending an act doing a stream where he announced it to the world. I'm gonna elaborate as much as I can. I'll tell you this, it's a bittersweet moment as they call it. Today, while announcing it, I would like to call it more bitter than sweet. But I get straight to it. Uh, and, and really, I'm doing this a little bit early, but I'm doing it for my audience, even though there's probably other people not here, but you will also see in about an hour and a half. Uh, my time on everyday struggle is over. Ultimately, and as well, everyday struggle is over. This is something that I'm preemptively letting you guys know because it's not over today. We have about two weeks left, but the show will conclude I believe the official and last date is December 17th. I'll explain the whole bittersweet because no matter, I've seen the comments time and time again. I've seen the YouTube videos from YouTubers saying, act, leave, do this. Let me start with where, when, why, who, and what happened, right? So the what is clearly that, again, my time with everyday struggle is complete. But also the show is going to end. The show is ending next month. <clears throat> I will be on the show until the show ends. I'm hoping y'all ask the why. <laughs> like, okay, why? But I could tell, you know, by the way, I've seen the comments. I've seen, I've seen, th th this is something I've seen a lot of times where clearly y'all wanted me to leave. Well, a lot of y'all. I'm not saying all y'all. Y'all want me to leave. Yo, you should did this, you should did that. But I'll answer the why in case anyone does care. <clears throat> the why of why the show is ending i think me and complex are going in different directions at least how we see everyday struggle as how we see maybe my employment for everyday struggle as how we see my brand and how they see me as someone who's worked there for a while to be very clear and give context for people, Everyday Struggle was the only Aaron show on Complex's media platform that was airing multiple times per week. Anyway, <clears throat> I'm going to be very transparent here because I don't know if they will, but I came up off being transparent. And honestly, I could tell you some of the last couple conversations with Complex was maybe a argument on transparency, which I felt they were neglecting how big my brand was and how I needed to act or communicate because of that. And maybe they were thinking that I could just operate like a Complex employee. I will say overall, I have nothing bad to say about Complex, but... I want to salute to Nadesco who made it a point to say, hey, this is going to come from us, not a dry, heartless press release, because despite whatever, there are people and there's an audience for everyday struggle. Yes, it was a very weird moment with the Chrissy Teigen thing, but it wasn't only that. I received calls from them about other content that they felt I probably or shouldn't be engaging in. And I, I specifically told him, I said, listen, while you may look at me as I'm the guy on your show, I have a whole different brand to run. And I said, I got suspended for uh, um, 
my little it was a twitch thing and i referred to chrissy teigen whatever whatever i don't whatever but i i remember saying to them if you guys are gonna police what i do off of your platform not realizing that i have to defend my own platform that i'm building i never came here to be an employee you should also keep the same energy i felt it was a spit in the face when complex while trying to tell me that i should shut the fuck up almost or just hey listen we are getting you in trouble for this you said something about chrissy teigen that's not okay they awarded i mean literally couple days after they awarded freddie gibbs with like lyricist or like some some like award even though he was saying that he couldn't wait till i die that he could spit on my casket it told me a lot it told me that for an artist who technically and they told me they said technically we're not paying him and the team that does that does whatever they want to do so it, it, it told me i was fighting with my hands behind my back by the way here's the thing and this is what i've always said about everyday struggle Joe once said it too, but I, I also agree. You don't hire a controversial figure to not have controversy. This is not an indictment on complex. I understand business. I run a business myself. But I'm going to be honest. The last conversation I had with, with someone of executive you know, control over there, I told him, I said, hey, I, I'm running a business as well. If you think I'm just going to shut up while these people say whatever about me because I'm working a complex, I do have to then let you know that 90% of the income I'm getting is not because of complex. And I, and I, I don't want to ever be the egotistical person to pull the card like, yo, I'm bigger than complex or bigger than any brand. But it felt like they were saying I should operate within their standards while they would bring on anyone who would slander me. You're always going to run into this. I think Joe ran into this. It's company versus creator. Joe has told y'all, when me and Joe walked into that building, they had a whole bunch of people who were doing video, a whole bunch of people who were writing. The guy who talked to me who said he had a whole team studying my YouTube channel. This is 2016. I'm covering Drake and Meek Beef in 2015. Covering Drake and Meek. Three weeks later, him nor anyone he hired was there. They fired everybody. It's like, oh, we're hiring you to study these, but we just hire these. You're obsolete. Fired. When I went there and the people who were hired there, I saw them all go. I didn't even understand the magnitude of it. Joe did. I did. It was new. I've never been on camera. <clears throat> I guess why I'm telling you that part of the story is because... Things changed. If you ever ask me what I'm ever guilty of, and I've, me and my, me and my, like, this is outside, like, you know, like, um, career shit. Leaf, all my other homies that, you know, we went to college. Sometimes we've been guilty of staying at the party too long. Nine months in, Joe left. Joe kind of offered up all of brands not all of brands but like invitation to come to revolt i'm gonna be honest with you i wasn't with it i'm gonna be honest with you just because i just got a lawyer if y'all not talking to me like joke I, listen it should be very evident in what i built because them bum ass are struggling facts i'm gonna be all right you know i like what, what joe did because you see even right now joe joe be make joe making millions he don't care you see them little bum ass that y'all be like Rory and me anymore? Them is living from check to check. Them is really down bad. That was never me. Ask Joe what I pull up to his crib. Very first time. Put up, I pulled up to his crib with a $180,000 car. G-Wagon. Facts. I got that from YouTube. I was doing really well. I was making 100000 a month. We went to Complex. They were giving us 10000 for it was supposed to be a weekly show. Joe and his ambition, Joe's a good creative. He's a great creative, actually. He said, F a weekly show, we need to do this daily. So we accepted the terms for a daily show. I said, mm. Again, I was never there for money. I didn't collect a check from them for six months. I'm good already. <clears throat> but 
that's the parallel in between where I've been. Let me let let me be very clear. So just let me again, let me reiterate. I was getting a hundred thousand dollars plus a month on YouTube. Complex paid us ten thousand a month. So literally a month of YouTube equaled 10 months of complex. But it was this elusive industry that I wanted to be a part of. I didn't want to be the YouTube guy. I wanted to be the guy that when you saw him, I was synonymous with hip hop. And by the way, I do think I accomplished that. But that is where I sat for the last, especially, especially year. Joe moved on quickly because of his own reasons. It's neither, it's not on me to speak on his reasons, but I can speak on mine. He moved on after nine months. I stayed on for three and a half years. By the way, it's three and a half years. I've done the show. What I came to Complex for, to be ingratiated with an industry which is so fake, but to be known as a household academics name, I accomplished, I think, rather quickly. And so that brought an end to an era of academics and traditional media. He hasn't accepted another job for many corporate companies since. Instead, he's continued to build up his own brand. And in 2018, Ack attempted to launch a career in rap music under the rap name Lil Ack. He dropped a few music videos where he dressed like mumble rappers and took what seemed to be the same approach musically as he did in media, using satire. However, a lot of people just really disliked this move and as usual, act noticed. He took the music down off of his main page and put up a community post that said, so after the recent feedback, I've decided to stop putting music on this channel. I understand a lot of you have subbed for rap news and when you see a music video or a song, you instantly dislike it. For that, I understand, and I'll keep this strictly rap news media related content with me involved. For those who don't mind or do like the music, I've created a new channel for that. Subscribe for music related things here, and he put a link to a new music channel that he created. He continued, I'm trying to figure out the best solutions not to make you guys mad, but also do the things that I enjoy. I've done rap news for many years, but I also enjoy making music and also plan on signing new artists. Still with that, I understand that this page, my main platform, is not the place where that belongs. Now, despite what some see as a failed music career, Academics did manage to run up over 19 million streams on his song Lanes featuring 6 ix 9 However, he since slowed up on the music front and pretty much stayed in his lane on covering rap news and live streaming daily. Throughout his rise though, Ack has given a lot of opinions on things that have happened in the music industry. And this has led to numerous back and forth with people over the years. Some of these were people paying their respects to Ack's hustle and others were not so friendly. We covered a few earlier with Vic Mensa and Chrissy Teigen, but there were so many more and Ack normally comes out on top of these disputes. For example, with Vic Mensa, after their back and forth on everyday struggle, Vic continued to take shots at Ack. Last question, I gotta ask this. Were you really about to beat the brakes off for DJ Academic? Because <laughs> yes. I feel like... I'm feeling nervous. <laughs> okay. right. 100%. No, I mean, I, I, I planned to whip uh, DJ Academics before he ever had a TV show. Let's just go ahead with DJ Academics. Yes. <laughs> Yo! Big Mensa album is on Friday. Wackademics. 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 Oh. Oh! Wow, spicy. No. We're about to do numbers. However, this was one of the last times that Vic Mensa would pop up in the media cycle, and he has since become rather obscure. The only thing that I can think of in recent history with Vic Mensa is when DJ Academics invited him onto his off the record podcast in 2023. It seems like the only time Vic pops up in the media is when he's beefing with Act, which I think says a lot about Act's influence. The next beef that Act was involved in again came on the set of Everyday Struggle, but it was Act's comments offset on his YouTube channel that had Wale feeling some type of way. Act had called Wale corny numerous times in his videos, and when they sat down together, Wale just had to get it off of his chest. 
And while the two never did resolve any of their issues publicly, after watching Wale say that he wasn't mad at Ak for the things that Ak had said, before getting mad at Ak for the things that Ak had said, it really only shows again how much impact academics and his outlet can have on the people that they discuss. They never did resolve this issue publicly, but in 2018, almost a year after the episode aired, Wale was dropped from Atlantic Records and Ak was right there to give his thoughts on it. Now, let me tell y'all this, man. I keep telling y'all no good will come on to y'all once you go against academics in the chat. All right, man. Now, Wale. All right. Now, Wale, uh, a guy who has had an issue with me a couple weeks ago, not a weeks ago, a couple months ago, this was while MMG Weekend was going on. Wale sent me a bunch of texts at 5 a.m. just going on a rant randomly. And I was like, what the f is going on with Wale if you're at MMG Weekend? Because when I see videos of Rick Ross at MMG Weekend, it'd be Rick Ross surrounded by a thousand thotties. I could imagine at 4 a.m. what's going on. But Wale was sending me all these emotional texts about, yo, listen, man, yo, Joe can't save you. Yo, and I'm like, what is, what, what's Wale talking about? However, uh, I'll give you a brief history. And by the way, the news is that Wale is no longer in Atlantic Records. I've been new this, okay? Atlantic cut the fat, all right? And what I mean, cut the fat they're not really just dropping people they believe are untalented they're dropping people who just ain't gonna sell okay now i remember when i notoriously said that wale selling twenty eight thousand records with shine was a flop a lot of people well not a lot of people wale himself was trying to explain it away and i was like wale let's call a spade a spade okay however here's the thing because i remember when he came to my show he was notoriously was trying to tell me that he was the cool guy and i had no place to call him corny and i was just trying to say bro i'm just speaking what i see on the internet about you i'm just telling you what have said about you bro he didn't want to hear that okay i thought that was a disconnect with reality a disconnect with the majority of opinions i see about him and clearly when his album doesn't perform well i think that's kind of proof atlantic records dropped him i gotta think twenty-eight thousand records so first week they probably looked at this and said man we gave this his big ass budget to sample Michael Jackson PYT and this is what you do first week likability is one thing I've always said about Wale Wale is on a list of that just aren't super likable do I think he should sign to another major I say no but I think that comes with him humbling himself a little bit this is just my opinion and I'm pretty sure Wale gonna see this thing send me another long ass text message however he got dropped and Wale hasn't really been in any major news cycles since then. Another person that he got into it with was Nicki Minaj after he gave commentary on her use of a Malcolm X picture as the cover art for one of her songs. Nicki didn't like what Ag had to say, so she filed a copyright strike against his video in an effort to have it removed from YouTube, but in typical Ag fashion, he refused to let her attempt pass in silence and he made the whole thing public before eventually having his video reinstated. And then he made another video where he shows the DMs that she sent him on Instagram Instagram during this whole process. And she said, yo, you gonna be in New York this week? I said, yup. She said, and by the way, this was a couple days later. She said, and I've never seen this switch up. Listen to this. Who does this sound like to you? You've been mad since I made a joke about you with Joe on my show. The people you rep won't be able to stop your jaw from getting broke. <laughs> Shrekky? What is Nicki Minaj talking about? What gang am I rapping? The people you rap? Does Nikki think she's a blood? Is Nikki a blood? I don't even know. I'm not saying she is or she isn't. But God damn it, Nikki talking spicy. Let's continue. She says, and this is where I believe she goes over the line. I know too much about your family for you to be playing with me, you whole ass rat. Where you at now? So I'm really thinking this got to be a joke. Like Gangsta Mirage, I've never seen this before. I've never seen Nikki really start like knowing that, yo, we live in an age of transparency. You're not going to just smile in public, threaten niggas in private and think nobody ever connects the dots. OK, so I'm laughing. I'm like, yo, noted. OK, thumbs up. She's like, where you at? So I'm like, wait, is, is she serious? So I continue to then say to her, I said, New York, as I said before, your threat is received, LOL. We'll see each other at some point, I'm sure. Take care, babe. 
This is where, bro. If you if this ain't a meltdown, I don't know what it. She says exactly. Ho, still sad. Takashi ain't here no more. So you could try to get a sneak feel on his booty. Don't talk about a woman that run from a man. I'm glad it's received, rat. It won't be the only thing you will receive. Oh my god, I can't believe it. Yo, this is the queen. Is this the queen? I said, sure. I said, just don't play the woman card on me. I criticize your ex, Meek, mad times. While you're with them, I've criticized everyone. I'm petty like the best of them, and so are you. I know. I know how to dish it, and I know how to take it, okay? Now, she then went into basically involving her husband. Now, her husband ain't a rapper. Husband ain't a manager. Husband ain't a publicist. Her husband ain't even a rep for a record label. But she says, okay, cool. My husband want to speak to you. Send your Addy or your phone number. Nothing more to talk about. Nah, I didn't respond. I said, man. And by the way, I, my thought wasn't complete from the last thing I said to her. So I was continuing to type. I said, yo, just like how you take offense and shit all the time, I take offense. Just that she could know my position, I take offense. Not at the name calling. And the name calling, which is, oh, she called me Alvin and the Chipmunk. I don't care about that. But I said, one thing you did say in your little, because Nicki Minaj is playing the victim so well now. She comes up with these conspiracy theories of why people want her to lose and everybody else to win. Now, in one of those conspiracy theories, she said, academics is basically under the control of this Atlantic Cardi B, like monster that's meant to derail Nicki Minaj's greatness. And I'm like, what, 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 get the f- going out of here mentioning me in that bullshit. Mention everybody else. I got a brand. I got a reputation. I work for my sh- I'm not going to just let you throw me into some conspiracy theory and not defend myself. Your Atlantic conspiracy theories or whatever else that makes you feel good about the energy you're receiving from fans, insiders, and some artists ain't got nothing to do with me. I'm just team me. Then she's like, I right, to send your number or your addy. My husband want to discuss something that's not okay. So I said, Nikki, stop playing dumb. You already know my addresses. You know the ones I frequent. You have my phone numbers because your fans leak them every f- two months. And then it got to this last part, okay, where I sent a heart and y'all got it. Listen, this is probably the funniest thing I've seen in a long while. She said randomly, because I went to sleep, because I was slumped off the handy, I went on Twitch, and then I got back, back, got back up. She said, last time I was in the studio with 6 9 he told me he could tell that you were hoping he was really gay in real life. And that you tried to touch him in that pool. The reason you mad is due to me and him being closed before you went to jail. I didn't mean to hang out with your boyfriend in your head. I only meant to do a dope song. Post that part. Alvin and the Chip Funk. You gonna be hurt, hurt. Now, Nicki Minaj, I don't know if you were trying to, like, I don't know, trying to, like, uh, accuse me or even trying to shame me or saying, oh, yo, yo, I think you're gay. Nicki, you're 99% of your audience is gay. I'm sorry. You can't, like, use that line. Every time I've seen a barb, and I'm only going for my stats because my stats is the people who hit me up when you and your people leak my number. Most of the barbs are gay. So, first of all, you can't really try to shame people for being gay when your whole fan base is gay. Okay? That's number one. Number two, this is how I know I got under your skin because you're blatantly just making shit up. And even if you weren't making it up, I don't even give two f***s enough to care. But it's a good thing to laugh at. That's why I put it out there. If anything, though, all this did was discredit anybody's rationale arguing against academics being relevant. The sheer fact that these artists are able to avoid his opinion kind of proves his relevant. Another beef that he found himself involved in was with Toronto rapper Nav. After Nav got on Twitter and said academics hop on and off of so much, he probably got STDs, Act took to a live stream where he went into a tirade against the rapper, tearing him down the whole way. Who the f*** talks about Nav? Who? You gotta watch so your main single. You gotta watch my Meek. You like every other rapper. You just trying to get the conversation about yourself. We are not talking about you right now, Nav. Get a f- record. Don't write, don't write Uzi coattail to another collab. Where's your record? When it was all said and done, Nav is the one who was apologizing to act. Honest to God, the source is, it, 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 it's me. I, I started it. 
I'm uh, man enough to say that. Knew it instantly, like, as soon as, like, went out, like, yo, you know I'm tripping, you know? Again, all this did was solidify the notion that no matter how big a rapper thinks they are and how small they claim Ack is, they know going toe-to-toe -to -toe with him will undoubtedly cause some commotion, so they can't help but to engage. Meek Mill is a great example of this. Ack has criticized Meek over a ton of things over a ton of years, basically since he started covering the Drake and Meek Mill beef, and Meek has fired back at Ack, saying that Ack's platform is irrelevant. But at the same time, he's been mad multiple times over Ack's album reviews when it comes to Meek's projects, and has even gotten mad simply because Ack didn't post his projects. Meek even claimed that he was having Ack blacklisted from the industry, but to no avail. This all led to an hour-long clubhouse call where Meek and Ack argued back and forth, and Meek really didn't walk away with a W here. It just made him look bad. Then, during a versus battle, Meek hopped in the live comment section and said that he's finally got Ack's address, implying that he could do something to Ack if he wanted to, but all of that tough talk came to a stop when Ack tweeted out. Meek Mill tweeted that he finally had my location when he saw me on versus with 750,000 watching. Bro, I went to Complex for three years every morning at 7 a.m. Why you act like I was hiring for you? Stop it, dog. I hate you rappers. And Act was really speaking facts here, scoring him another W on the beef scorecard. Now, another beef that he was involved with was with a rapper named Casanova, who is now incarcerated after being indicted and convicted in New York on conspiracy charges. Academics had become a close friend with a rapper named 6ix9ine at the time, and 6ix9ine and Casanova didn't get along. This meant that Casanova and Act wouldn't get along. But after meeting, the two managed to move past their problem. He faked me out real quick. <laughs> you know, like the big, big bully, and you're like, why would you do that to me? This time and third. Yeah. And you're like, oh, okay, so let's go play. He just tricked me. I don't know. He got a good wordplay. If it didn't happen there, mm -hmm. it would it would have never, like, we would have, yeah, because I used to wait outside here. <laughs> it was like five times. In one month, I waited outside. I like In the end, the two ended up becoming friends, with them even collaborating on a song titled Knock Knock, where Act was the main character in the music video, and the song go pretty hard, honestly. Cass took to Twitter and said, I hated trolls for so long, guess that's why I made this song. Knock Knock video out now, featuring the biggest troll at Academics. But lately, he's been behaving himself, and now, that ass though, it's funny, cause I really wanted to do some ugly things to this man. One thing is for sure, if given the opportunity to, Ack will make content out of anything, but as we've seen, not all of his beefs end this way. And in one rare scenario, Ack received criticism from someone and Ack really didn't respond negatively to it. And that was when Nipsey Hussle basically called him out. It's kind of, cause uh, DJ Academics is a meatball to me. So he, he says stuff, he says some stuff about Chicago, rubbed me the wrong way. Yeah, he's a buster. He's he, a weirdo. It, it, Nick the whoop his ass in real life. He's, just, he's, behind the, he's behind the camera and you guys just let clowns be clowns, man. Like yeah. I, was, I, was on, I was on Everyday Struggle mm -hmm. and I walked out just because, you know, I just, I'm not a clown. I don't, I don't, I don't come from that world of like, you make jokes about, we used to f up, excuse me, are we live? Yeah, yeah we, 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 we can bleep this. We used to f up for trying to film fights right yeah. in the hood. Yeah. You fight. What you doing with the camera? We gonna make you fight. What's wrong with you, boy? Yeah. We ain't covering no drama. That's called instigating. Right. And what's up with you? Why you at it? Right. So, you know, like him get weeded out quick. He, he got a little internet run he going on, but, you know, we just got to let himself destruct because he, he's on the path. Instead of berating Nipsey or talking down on Nipsey, academics instead said that he was shocked by this statement and gave more insight into Nipsey's visit to everyday struggle. All right, all right, let me address this. Uh, Nipsey Hussle, I wasn't going to speak on this ever, really, just because out of just class. By the way, I'm going to give you the full truth. Y'all know I don't lie. But um, basically, Nipsey Hussle was on a, I believe, a radio show or a talk show in Chicago. I don't know who the host is. Looks like he has some issue with me. Whatever. But uh, Nipsey Hussle, when my name came up, Nipsey Hussle had less than kind words to say about me. This is what happened. More than enough everyday show. I'm basically there. Uh, Nipsey and his whole crew, they are in the green room or whatever the case is. Uh, we have our separate room that we're in. Basically, our producer goes to Nipsey that he's not blindsided and says, hey, check out the things we're going to be talking about. Okay. 
apparently either Nipsey's rep, uh, PR person, whatever, didn't really convey to him what type of show it is. He looks at the he looks at the rundown, and by the way, this is a day after Takashi got into a fight at LA. Very big topic, at least for that day in hip hop. Takashi was like he got in a fight with some other guy. Everybody was talking about it. The next day on Everyday Struggle, you have to talk about it, right? Nipsey says to our producer, I ain't talking about Takashi. I don't want to talk about him. Period. Okay. Specifically, he says, I don't want all the headlines from this interview to be Nipsey says this about Takashi. Okay. Clearly just trying to say, I know anything I say is going to be a bunch of headlines talking about what I just said about him. Okay. And again, this is where we were at. Right, so our producer comes up and says, I ain't gonna lie, Nipsey don't want to talk about nobody. Okay, so we look around and we're like, this is a debate show. Again, we're not doing interviews. We we have to debate. Now, I, I was even before, I said, we could cut the Takashi topic. At, I, at first, I told him, I, I said, yo, we could kill the Takashi topic. We don't got to talk about it. Okay, what about the other topics? Because I was excited to talk about Nipsey. I was excited to see him and talk to him. Now, anyway, clearly he was not into talking about anything. Um any topics that we had on the lineup and our producers told him it's not gonna work and i believe he politely left okay he didn't leave saying F- you or whatever whatever i uh, clearly he seemed to be fine so i thought i would never have to speak on that because again it seemed amicable maybe it was just a miscommunication his reps didn't tell him that yo they do like topics every day you're gonna have to give your opinion on other artists other artists music and just other sh- happening in the culture okay that's just the type of show it is i figured or i chalked it up as Yo, he didn't get that memo from his reps, so of course he came in not wanting to talk about people because he's just trying to promote his album, and because of that, he said, you know what, f*** it, let's not even do the show, he left. We did the show without him that day, and everything was fine. So, this conversation he's having with this gentleman is very surprising to me, it feels like it's one of those things where the more notoriety you get, more people are going to point fingers at you for either quote unquote ruining the culture or quote unquote any other situation that arises. To Nipsey, I was thoroughly confused by this. Got a lot of love for your music. It's okay if you don't have a lot of love for me. I wish you the best. So this is really one of the only times the act didn't engage himself with the artist and go back and forth. The next piece of beef academics found himself in was with rapper Freddie Gibbs. Now, real quick, while I was putting this section of the video together, I realized that the homie Matt, who runs the YouTube channel, What's the Dirt, has already done a fantastic job of chronicling this portion of Act's story. He has a whole 25 minute video breaking it all down. Now, his research was used for this specific part of the story. So y'all go show him some love over there on his channel because he's dropping bangers consistently. And again, thanks to him for letting me use his research for this part of the video now dj academics and freddie gibbs is a beef that has spanned over four years and just won't seem to quit but it's always been that way in fact when freddie gibbs was charged with some foul stuff in austria academics actually was playing devil's advocate for him my thing is the only thing troubling to me is the lack of proof which they filed these charges and extradited him on. He even met face to face at one point and Freddie offered Act a chance to smoke with him and chill. In 2017, on like a balcony and he was trying to get me to smoke. He's like, yo, Act, you smoke this with me. I don't smoke. But the piece didn't last long and these two would eventually start beefing over the most trivial thing. There was a video that popped up online from Crime Stoppers TV in Atlanta showing a news station interviewing rapper Gunna. Act posted the video and Freddie decided that he was going to speak on it, writing in a tweet, if you was on Crime Stoppers TV, you would snitch. A simple statement, but one that would begin an all-out war between these two. People now just don't know what snitching is. And, and people okay. like Freddie Gibbs complicate it. If you're on Crime Stoppers, you would snitch. Right? There's a blanket-ass tweet. This is where we see Freddie Gibbs officially take shots at Act in an Instagram live video where he basically calls him soft. Academics. You a let's get that out the way. I ain't saying no names or call no out or none of that. Shit. That's y'all saying these names, boy. This ain't no pick on academic. That nigga gonna bust a grape in a fruit fight. But academics isn't new to the game at this point. He's been in several back and forth, so he did what he does best and hit back in a commentary video. Freddy, you are here, so willing to call out a blogger. But when you were trying to talk about and stake this and possibly like take shots at Gunna and, and T.I., 
You're speaking in hieroglyphic codes. I didn't say no names. Come on, bro. Are you dumb? Freddy basically let it go and didn't respond to act. But a month later, he was on Bootleg Kev's podcast and was asked about Young Jeezy, the rapper who owns a record label that Gibbs used to be signed to. Gibbs basically says in that interview that Young Jeezy is musically irrelevant. This became a talking point on Everyday Struggle the next day. And when asked, Ax said that if Jeezy is irrelevant, then Freddie is 100% irrelevant too. From here, the two go back and forth on Twitter. Academics was talking mad trash about Gibbs being broke and not selling records, but Gibbs really outclassed Ack in this one. Because instead of hurling insults back at him, Freddie just hit him with jokes. One in particular was when he simply said, bruh, you built like a Teletubby. He then proceeded to make Academics Teletubby t-shirts, selling them to his fans and capitalizing monetarily off of the whole incident, and I think that's actually hilarious, but anyways, it resulted in Academics doing a drunken live stream where he takes shots at Henny and then takes shots at Freddie Gibbs. Oh my god, it's Freddie Gibbs. Freddie Gibbs ain't successful as chat. You think you sell a little 28,000, 29,000, 30,000 you lit? Let's do it, bruh. I've been waiting for a rapper to start talking that you built like a Teletubby. Look, he just tweeted seven minutes ago. I'm not responding to you again. Uh, 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 I'm not responding to you again, Freddie Gibbs. You clearly have let the world know you don't got more money than me. Shut the f up. Clearly, Act was feeling some type of way about the jokes, but this live stream is actually the same live stream that we seen earlier in the video where he took shots at Chrissy Teigen, something that resulted in him being suspended from Complex. Gibbs soaked up the moment and went on Instagram Live where he spit a freestyle dissing academics. Y'all listen to this. Uh, cancel that, get that fat. You know that fat ass line. Uh, ain't with me. When I catch academic, I'ma squeeze the tears. I'ma squeeze your breasts. Uh, nigga, let the tips hit your chest. How the tips hit your chest? Jason Gibbs, I'm the best. Academics here. Guess it gives young getting rich. Then he went on Desu Samero's podcast and continued going in on act. I told him don't f with me. This whole ass uh, got mad because he thought I was uh, talking about Gunna or something like that, and T.I. or something like that. And then when I made the little uh, cheesy comments, he wanted to jump in front of them bullets too. I don't think Academics even got a whip. He definitely, he definitely is a minivan type of I would jump in the sewer to fight academics right now. I would go, I would go, I would go Ninja Turtle on this right Yo, now. Yo, my, my my son want to whoop academics. Me too. He like ABC. We working on how to say academics. And even though he had been suspended and forced to apologize by Complex, Act was right back at it the next week. Well, you look like a Teletubby. Yo, matter of fact, yo, six nine. I'm like, great. So I'm like, yo, this is cool. So I understand, like you, you like you will look. You're a smaller rapper, so you're gonna use my name for attention. And he's been dissing me for a week. It's cool, but like you know, everybody be like, "Yo, act, you're getting killed." Like, you want me to do a meme? You, you want me to make memes and just post against him? I could, but he's gonna win. You know why? He never had this attention. In less than 24 hours, Freddie responded again, even though he was on vacation at the time. I heard that you might lose your job. <laughs> I don't know if that's fact or fiction or it might be a rumor. Thank you, beautiful. I appreciate you. You know what I'm saying? Thank you. Got it. Hey, all good. Hey, hey, look. If you need a job, my office still stands. Two things got to be done, whole ass. We're going to whoop you first. And you got to tell us where the 6 9 be hiding at. You a snitch, so I know you a snitch. This out. Then there was radio silence for the next few months before Act hit the stream again with a bottle of Henny in his hand and went on another drunken tirade. Freddie Gibbs, that trash. I heard because I told my I'm richer than him and his whole family. I've been tight ever since. That bum ass out of here, man. You think Freddie Gibbs on my playlist? I throw somebody out of a moving car playing that bullshit on my aux. That bum ass. I had that on my playlist, period. And Freddie, when you see this, I'm not about to go back and forth with you on Instagram. You a trash, bro. Facts. Boy, you made more money off selling a shirt with my face on it than you made off selling your album. Facts. I ain't got to talk about that no more. Less than two weeks later is when we seen Academics do that stream where he said the everyday struggle was ending. And we seen the clip earlier, but listen again now that we have some context on his beef with Freddie Gibb. My time on everyday struggle is over. Ultimately, and as well, everyday struggle is over. I think me and Complex are going in different directions. 
when Freddie Gibbs was on his thing, I, I remember saying to them, if you guys are gonna police what I do off of your platform, not realizing that I have to defend my own platform that I'm building, I never came here to be an employee. I felt it was a spit in the face when Complex, while trying to tell me that I should shut the fuck up, they awarded, I mean, literally a couple days after, they awarded Freddie Gibbs with like lyricist or like some, some like award even though he was saying that he couldn't wait till I die that he could spit on my casket. Now, Freddie did what he does best and made a few posts clowning academics for the show shutting down. And then things went silent again for a while with academics even saying that he thought the beef was done. Actually, I'm gonna be honest with you, respectfully to Freddie Gibbs, yo, yo, he let that go. He wanted me, like, I haven't heard him say nothing about me in a while. So I don't know if, he's, if he says something recently, we could get back to beef going on. I don't really want but whatever, whatever it's worth, he just stopped. But again, the piece didn't last. Two months later, academics posted a video of two rappers getting into a scuffle at Rolling Loud, and Freddie quote tweeted Ak saying, I hope you post it when I ran into you, implying that they would get into a fight when they seen each other too. Then he took it a step further when he posted another tweet, basically saying that he could have had Ak smoked if he wanted to by this point. Now up until now, the internet had basically chalked this whole beef up to Freddie had won. But at this point, the narrative started to shift and Act started to make a comeback. He called Freddy out for talking like he was going to do something when in reality, he hadn't done anything. You got on that Twitter with that woulda, coulda, shoulda. I could have did this to him. You stupid. Everybody know where my headquarters at. I'm going to be there tomorrow. You ain't going to be there. Yo, stop playing them games. You were internet, bro. Freddie Gibbs, you were internet. Shot at you in real life. You did nothing. Now you're trying to act like because you think I can't go really. Bro, you know where I'm at. Come do something. Freddy, don't tweet at me. Don't make memes. Don't do nothing. Everybody should hear, I, yo, I got pressed by Freddy. If we ain't hear that, you. Freddy simply replied with a tweet that said, last time you lost your job, don't lose your life trying to make a point you can't prove. And he added academic. Basically up till this point, Act was limited on what he could say due to his employment with Complex, but this time he wasn't employed by them and he didn't hold back like he had been doing previously. And during an episode of his podcast off the record that had just launched on Spotify, academics decided it was time to really push back and expose some things that most people didn't know about Freddie Gibbs. I gotta give you the history on this guy because you would be shocked if you heard his lyrics. I know you'll never listen, you'll never Google it. You won't even look here on Spotify to find it. But if you hear his music, you would think that this guy has a hundred bodies. He's moved thousands of kilos of coke, meth. He's the biggest drug dealer since Pablo Escobar, but such is the case with many of your rap favorite rappers who are portraying and lying to you about who they really are. Now, Frederick Tipton, and I'm gonna tell you why I'm giving this government name and giving the history of him. His father is a police officer. This guy is just like academics, civilian. And then the very next day, he went live and played a video that featured people from Freddy's hood claiming that Freddy was as fake as he gets and that he couldn't return to his hood. Frederick Gibbs, old, gang have disowned him and they want to stand with Lil Ack. They want me to come to Gary, Indiana, walk up and down the block, see how they really live in, and for them to explain to me that the basement dweller, Frederick, was about that life. They've been trying to get a hold of me for years. Watch this video. They say what I thought they said, did they? Now this didn't look good for Freddie, but the very next day, Freddie went to his hood to prove that he could and made a video about it where he again name drops academics. If I'm just where they said I could go. You know what I'm <laughs> Tell him pull up then. I'm not supposed to be over here. <laughs> I'm gonna go shout out to DJ Academics. <laughs> I'm coming for them titties. I'm squeezing. I, I, look, he said he gonna fly these out. I hope you fly these feet ass out to you so they can steal all your they camera equipment. <laughs> fly these feet ass out. I would like to got see it. That's gonna be bobbity when that happens. Yeah, yeah. Gibbs went on to do a couple of live shows where he also had the crowd chanting this. Academics. Academics. 
Shortly after, Ack's Instagram account was suspended, but Ack appealed the decision and got his account back. Then took to Twitter saying, I got my Instagram back. They said that Freddie Gibbs snitched on me, but I beat the case. Freddie, I don't want no more beef with you. You literally the police. And on the same day, during a live stream, he invited Freddie to actually fight him. Bruh, I'm, I'm done with the public. If you want to square up my we can do it here. Well, unless you're trying to link, please keep my name out your mouth. You snitched on me already, you know I'm at. I'm done with the end of antics. Now the next time that Axe speaks about Freddy was on his episode of Million Dollars Worth of Game, hosted by Gilly the Kid and Wallow. And, you and this at. is where I realized that Freddy Gibbs is 6'9". And 6'9", I'm gonna tell you why. Freddy Gibbs is the son of a cop. Freddy Gibbs' brother is a, is a doctor. His other brother is a district attorney, okay? Let's keep all these things in mind, right? Father, cop, brother, district attorney, other brother, a doctor. Remember, these are the gangster rappers. He's claiming he's vice lord. He's all, he's big, tough, and everything. He's tweeting out public threats to me. I could have killed you, right? G give everything like this in mind, right? There's not nobody from where he's from in Gary, Indiana. They all hit me. Nobody's vouching him. He's saying what he would do to me. I hit him in the DMs. This is a fact. I hit him in the DMs. I said, brother, I know you're trolling because you're trying to promote an album. I said, but it looks like you have a problem with me because when you start talking certain things, we could find a way to resolve it. I said, when do you want to meet up? I DM'd him this. This is facts. It's, on, it's documented on air. So you wanted to rumble him? Anything you wanted to do. And only three days later, Gibbs was back at it, responding to act. I'm, tra I'm training for a fight right now, man. <laughs> Oh, you traded for a fight. Breaking news on Jalen and Jacob. Oh, we got breaking news. Breaking news. Who breaking is news. Freddie Gibbs training to fight? DJ Academics. He is. He is. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm a solid. I'm a solid 185. DJ Academics a soft 204. So I think we can make that. You know, we can make that that fight happen. You know what I'm wow. saying? I don't want no money if I win. I just want Academics to delete his Instagram and delete his Twitter and lead a rap game. You know what I'm saying? It's all good. Then Freddie releases a video of Ack in college boxing him bro look at this footage it's it's kind of it's kind of sad academics you sure you want to box me let me see this hey, hold on. Yeah, oh, 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 oh. oh got you what the you want to be at i don't think you do three days later and karma hit that boy freddie in the head when headlines broke saying that he had gotten jumped by jim jones crew that reports are coming in that little bill aka Frederick tipton was being tossed around like tumbleweed up in prime 112 in Miami. He forgot that not everybody is going to retweet and subtweet him, okay? I heard he falcon punched that shiny peanut head ass in the gut and had him throwing up his hors d'oeuvres. I heard his face was indented in the drywall multiple times. The next day, Freddie posted a picture to Instagram of him holding a gun, and academics immediately made a video going in on him for it. So he has to try to, like, you know, redeem his reputation in whatever way he can. So he start posting his guns, you know what I mean, in the center. And I could tell his ego and his gangsterism is so fragile, so, so fragile, that the mere fact that he's being clowned by the entire internet by because he got tossed around like tumbleweed in a up-class restaurant, turning his ego. Then, news broke that Freddy was dating an adult entertainer, and Ack again took to his live to speak on the situation. Find this girl's name. There's, I'm telling you, I went to his profile. He's kissing her in the mouth. I went to her profile. It's a gigantic in her I couldn't believe it. Then a few weeks later, Freddy catches another beat now from Benny the Butcher's on a rise. They catch him over here. Holy. The craziest part about it, TMZ hit me. TMZ says, Ack, we got the footage. I said, he said, we only need you to tell us one thing. Which one is Freddie Gibbs? That stuck out like a sore thumb. I drew the arrow for them. <laughs> then Academics hops on a call with Freddie Gibbs' former manager, where he continued to clown on him. You know, what's going to happen when you and Freddie Gibbs see each other? Let's talk about that. Hold on, all right, let me ask you, does Freddie Gibbs got hands? Because I ain't see no hands in that video. Hey, you're hey, you going to find out. No, I'm asking you, though. I'm saying you're going to find out when you see him. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> nah, he, you need to apologize to him. Why would I apologize to a dude who just got beat up three times in a row? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, girl. But things continued to get worse for Freddie. Benny the Butcher took to Instagram where he claimed that he had stole Freddie's chain and act, of course, made a video about that. Dragged you by your took this off your neck. 
you been getting ran down on this for the past year without a gun you a now ever since he got beat up like three times a year you know jim jones called him gave him the beats okay and then of course he caught the beats by a bunch of geriatric bros from buffalo with timberland boots on and by the way his chain got took or his girl chain Whatever chain you want to say got took, some chain got took. Now Freddie responded to act in a freestyle on Funk Flex's radio show. The eye I'm the bad guy, this rap about to squeeze academics teeth. I love a fat you a dick in the booty, go get the strap. They said then Freddie had another appearance on Bootleg Kev where he continued to talk about act. You know, like my try to play with me and I just make their ass and I turn their ass into memes, ass academics. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Like. And like I said, I don't even know him like that either. I probably met him like once or twice, but you know, it seemed like he got everything in the world to say about me, and that's cool. He's been a he's been a big promotional force for me these past two years. So thank you, academics. I appreciate you. Um, Do you feel like there was a point in time during the academics thing, maybe you're putting a little too much energy into ac? Not at all. I just dissed him the other day on Flex. What you mean? Because I ain't never ain't never too much energy. Ain't no ain't no ain't never too much energy into a nigga that. Talk about your girl, your family. Ain't never too much energy. Yeah, that's it, ain't, it ain't never too much energy. You gonna get, you gonna get these muff bullets. After this, a clip hit the internet of At getting into it with an ex girlfriend and screaming like a little girl, not getting her way. And Freddie decided he was gonna make a reaction video to it. I'm the nigga. You the nigga. Having uh, a tough interview for this, that's for sure. Hey, you're still a person. Oh my god. <laughs> then he spit even more bars about act when he was featured on the LA Leakers. Academics, I'm the prize. Uh. <laughs> I'm the prize. Hey, academics, you're abusive. Stop taking them purses and all that for them girls, man. Here we go. LA Leakers, man. Come to the West Coast, man. We'll buy yeah. you a purse if you want a purse. I got you. Now, right here, things take another turn for the worse for Freddie. Him and his girl break up, and she hops in academics DM to try to expose Freddie and act had a field day with this. Bruh, this girl was trying to come on my platform, expose this thing of Freddie Gibbs. And this is why I be trying to say to like Freddie Gibbs, like Freddie, why are you really even into it with me like that? Like yo, that you really like literally spilled your soul to is trying to expose you, my. She's like, trying to expose you, like you're a weirdo. You're getting, you're getting doing, you're 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 a weirdo, my. Now, Act decided to not have Freddie's baby mama on his platform at this time, but he did continue to troll him. Um, I want to salute to my man Freddie Gibbs. You know what I mean? We are trying to book Freddie Gibbs' girl for a scene yes you know what i mean a little a little chat or feel me we're probably gonna try to see if we could do something where we pick a few contestants from the chat at this point his ex-girlfriend is pregnant and she goes on the twitter to talk about how freddie told her he wasn't ready for a kid and basically dipped the moment that he found out this led to her telling people about some things freddie allegedly likes to do in the bedroom and act although he passed the first time when it came to interviewing her decided that this time he was gonna give her a call on his stream. I'm offering ten thousand dollars to have the name and rights to Freddie Jr.'s child. Ten thousand dollars to do this. Hello, Destiny. How you doing? Hey, what's up? What do you feel about? Well, you obviously exposed him, but what do you feel about? Like, I've never really liked him. But like his character is kind of being like, you know, uh, uh, um, crystallized on social media. What right. do you what do you feel about everybody talking about him? Which which, you know, some people might be like, well, still, he, he's going to be the father of your child. It was it was like watching the downfall of Freddie get. Now, after this, some unfavorable photos popped up online, allegedly showing Freddie basically 
spread out, leading to academics calling him Spready Gibbs. And this even started trending on Twitter. Now, if you like that portion of the story, the act versus Freddie part, remember that all of that research was done by Matt over on What's the Dirt. He's got a ton of content like that and he drops bangers on the regular. So if you like that portion, that deep dive of Freddie Gibbs and academics, y'all go subscribe to his channel. Again, I really appreciate him letting me use that research for this video. I appreciate you, Matt. Now, moving on. It isn't just rappers that act has found himself in the beef with though. He also has had a few problems with other media figures as well. A good example of this is his beef with another YouTuber that did hip hop commentary, Dom is Live. Dom is Live made news commentary in the same vein as Act did, but he started after academics, basically building his channel off of Act's blueprint. Now, instead of showing love to Dom when he was coming up, act kind of felt jaded about the whole thing leading to the two exchanging words dom posted a picture of himself with academics on his shoulder like basically looking like his son and he made a few videos talking pretty reckless about act now act fell back on basically saying that without him there is no dom is live and accused him of basically stealing his whole format and wanting to be him in this live video right here. And I built my own base. Stop lying, you've been grinding at my fans the whole no time. Dom, can I ask you a question? Do you think I sit back and be like, oh my God, I'm like worried about Dom? Just be honest. Some people feel you are. I don't want to be you, bro. I it's would believe you if you weren't talk. obsessed, my Heavy. Since then, Dom has basically stopped making YouTube videos altogether and he's become pretty obscure, at least on YouTube. He does have an Instagram page that's kind of popping, but his YouTube is as dead as it could get. Now, Act basically got in front of this whole thing and ended it early, putting another W under his belt when it comes to beefing. The size of his influence and success in media has been his number one weapon when it comes to beefing with others in the media world. Case in point of this is when he was beefing with two guys named Rory Amal, who were co-hosts on the Joe Budden podcast after Joe Budden left Everyday Struggle. See, Joe and Act haven't always seen eye to eye, but in the long run, they've always had mad love for each other. But Joe had talked down about Act with Rory Amal in the past. Academics is one of the biggest I've ever seen in my entire life. But he, yeah. he should never comment on anything that has to do with physicality. <laughs> but, but, we, but we knew that already. I don't more, fault and, him for being a when you know he's a Well, you got to stop talking sometimes when you oh, is what I'm, is what been, I mean. That's I've what, been saying that and Charlamagne no, killed yeah. me for saying that. I agree. <laughs> I agree. There's nothing wrong with being but you got to be to the corner sometimes just shut up but him and joe have always had a working relationship him rory and ma however have not they talk reckless just like joe did but they aren't joe button and act felt some type of way about it i'll be honest with you i, I was a little disgusted at some of the media outlets and, and people that were saying rest in peace and to the people that think i'm talking about academics i am but not just him don't do your coverage to instigate the and then say rest in peace when it finishes. It's offensive. Yeah. It's gross. These certain dudes that they are giving these platforms to, they bozos. Like academics is a bozo. He should not have a platform like he has because when real life happens, he shows just how much of a bozo he is. Act didn't take the comments lightly. And while he didn't respond immediately, he did let it fester in his head until eventually he decided that it was time to strike back. And one of the first things that he did was expose their salaries for the work that they did on Joe Budden's podcast, claiming that they were nothing more than employees of Joe's and that they weren't even close to being in the same league as him. Yeah. Them dudes is getting forty thousand dollars a year, man. Shut up! Nobody want to hear you talk about like, like, like you're really breaking down the bread. Shut up! Joe could talk about it. Now it even made more sense because he was yeah. swindling them. Again, just like with Dom is live, using his success and sheer size to undermine his competition. But the big blow in this beef came when academics detailed the demise of Rory's engagement to his fiance. And some of those clips I can't play here because academics went in, but here's a small piece of it. So when I had to put my foot on that boy, okay, had his girl slapping him in the crib, okay, you feel me? I did that with a reason. He been getting beat up by his girl. I think she ran off with a wedding ring. It's over. Flawless victory. Hats off. Chatting. 
win, that bum will never mention my name again. Warrior Ma just haven't been the same since and ended up actually getting fired from Joe Button's podcast after thinking they were entitled to royalties or a percentage of the show instead of just a regular paycheck, further proving Axe claims that they were just employees. Now, they did jumpstart their own podcast after, but it hasn't been nearly as successful as anything that Axe has built or the podcast with Joe that they were involved in prior to them being fired. Ironically, though, Axe built his brand and name off of jumping into other people's business and covering even the most mundane topics. But when it was done to him by Adam22, who runs the No Jumper podcast, Axe didn't seem too fond of him digging. And in a four hour meltdown of a stream, Axe became unhinged as he talked with Adam22 and clearly was taking things a little too personal. He wants to know, did they run a train on your baby mama? What up? I mean, number one, whatever my girl has done in her private prior to me not really my interest so i mean i i don't feel any need to speculate about this at all you clown me just supposedly for being there why six not selena and selena was never my girl i didn't clown you i laughed tough. at the ment i laughed at the scenario she was describing and i i still feel like i'm within my right to laugh at the idea of you right, passing on. six yeah. nine, which is again what she said you you sneak this me you wouldn't want me to do the same thing to you because it would be bad for business. Now, this was more of just a back and forth than an actual beef, but Ack eventually did concede that Adam got the upper hand on him. Oh, Yo, I'm so frustrated, especially with Adam. Adam is one of like the interesting, you know, I don't want to call it beef, but like situations I've had because I'm getting at him and he's killing me with kindness. However, there are people in the media who find Ack's position to be troubling to say the least. Mostly those employed by traditional media companies like radio stations, people like Ebro and Peter Rosenberg. They've continuously tried to discredit academics for years, but he always falls back on the fact that they're employees and he's not, calling their critiques nothing more than sheer jealousy. The Ebros and the Rosenbergs hate my position in the culture because Ebro used to be the place that you needed to go to get relevance in hip hop. Radio is irrelevant. I think he resents me for that. He said, uh, I was paid by powerful people to make 6 9 happen. Little boy, stop playing with me. I was making $150,000 every month. If you think I need 6 9 to get a house, you're not good at math. If you think I need complex to get a house, you're not good at math. You work at Hot 97, you're not pulling no half a million a year. That was three months of pay for me. D don't try to ever diminish my work. You don't owe nothing you're on. There's nothing wrong with that. But the money looks a little different when you do own it. And that makes a valid point. They can be fired. He can. And his claim that he is more relevant than them really holds a lot of weight. Now, these are just some of the beefs that he's been involved in. And although there are countless more examples, I think you can see that this is all part of his strategy, one that has become extremely profitable for him, whether the people who dislike him like it or not. Academics now runs his podcast off the record where he sits down and interviews a ton of people from the industry and is still putting out live streams daily. His deal with Spotify was worth an estimated $10 million and he signed a two year contract with them in 2001 for that for his podcast. That contract ended in September of 2023 and Act was allowed to walk away with full ownership of his podcast and now he's able to distribute it to all platforms including his youtube channel one thing is for sure ack isn't slowing down or going anywhere anytime soon now while i was making this video a whole another part of this story started to develop ack has been accused of some serious things and while i was gonna end the video right where we were just at i think it's important that i take some time to cover the recent allegations against him so a few months ago, one of DJ Academic's ex-girlfriends hopped on a Discord server and posted photos of his ID and a prescription bottle for medicine, basically forced the act to go live and own up to catching chlamydia. She claimed that it was to treat herpes, but this medicine is basically just an antibacterial and it's not used to treat herpes at all. In fact, in a lot of cases, this isn't even used to treat chlamydia. Instead, it's often used to treat severe acne, but her posting those things on Discord did lead to academics going live and saying this. I had some symptoms, I had no symptoms. Um, later on, remember the only reason why this even came up, she said the person DM her too, and I'm like, nobody knew your Instagram, so how did they do it? Anyway, whatever. 
So that's why I had those pills, period. It doesn't treat herpes. That's the thing. It doesn't treat herpes. Now, she also got online and posted pictures of her with bruises, trying to insinuate basically that Ack had put hands on her, only to double back a few days later and retract her statement. Now, Ack forgave this woman for that and took her back, and things have been smooth selling since then, at least until last week, when things hit the fan again, and she started sending out pictures of Ack's third leg to people like Adam22, Troy Ave, and a few other people. Whack himself is saying it's not the girl I'm with. I know Blueface said online, and said, but it's not her, right? She's still wilding on me. I'm like, bro, like, yo, just chill out, my Like, bro, like, you could tell, like, Wack not even really on that. You, you want me to press him or some shit? Like, he not really on that. Any, anyway, long story short, she getting the feelings because now she's like, yo, you not going to press these over me, this and third, because, again, the main character syndrome. Shorty going to send pictures or really, like, weird things of me to like Adam 22 and Troy Ave. She's like, oh, I'm gonna show these that really I'm your and I got pictures of you that nobody would wanna see. And I'm like, this is why I'm even here. It's like, yo, bro, like what type of girl would do that? The reason this whole thing happened is because Wack 100 says some disparaging things about her on the No Jumper podcast. Act ended up in a call with Wack and Troy Ave on Clubhouse and she wanted Act to check Wack for the things that he had said during that podcast, but Act didn't want to, which upset her. Saw a compelling academics live stream about Blueface and Krishan the other day while I was getting a haircut. Academics hating on, look, I'm gonna be real. Well, they have a beef, yeah. Act is hating on, I'm gonna tell the world this. Okay. Right? Nephew, forgive me. Ax hating on Blueface because Blueface knocked his bra down. That's it. No, no, because you notice how he came out of nowhere with it? The Shay girl? I ain't gonna tell you which one. Now, Wack never name dropped this woman in his interview, but apparently she took it some kind of way and thought it was her that he was talking about, so she leaked Ax private photos. At this point, Ax is done. He wants out of the relationship, but he says that he really couldn't leave the relationship because she had something she was holding over his head. So in an effort to put himself in front of the story that she was holding over his head, he decided that he was going to expose himself before she could. Like if me and you locked in and you my like I've been giving you mad for two years. Why would you ever send some weird pictures of me or even do anything like that? But then I realized I'm an idiot. I'm a sucker. I'm really like on some down bad for the story I'm finna tell you. So this is a girl who's been trying to hold things against me because she really believes that I am so much in fear of these things getting out. So first and foremost, I'm gonna tell y'all a few things. The narrative unfolds like this. Academics have been intermittently communicating with a girl named Z for a couple of years. On one particular evening, he extended an invitation for Z to visit him for a week as she was supposed to be in town. He planned to have her stay at his place for that week and arranged an Uber for her. However, upon her arrival, academics having indulged a bit too much with the Henny ended up falling asleep. Meanwhile, Z found herself partying with two of academics' friends. The next morning, academic began to sense that something was amiss. He discovered Z in a state of undress and noticed anomalies around his pool area, including rearranged patio furniture. Puzzled, he inquired about the previous night's event, only to receive vague answers about just having a good time. His intuition nagging at him, academics decided that he was gonna review his security footage. The shocking revelation hit him. While he was asleep, Z had engaged in intimate activities with both of his friends simultaneously. I look at my camera in the morning. Gang. The shorty was getting like, I, I don't even, I don't even like, the, the, she was getting trained by my two mans. Like on my pool deck the night before when I'm sleeping, I'm dead ass, this would happen. I couldn't believe it. I'm like, what? I invited you over here. I paid a lift. The lift was like 200 bucks. She lived, I don't even want to say where she lived. I'm like, what? How could you come to my joint and get trained by my mans while I'm sleeping? Obviously, Act was a bit confused by what he was seeing and he just couldn't believe what was happening. So he confronted her with what he had found and here's how that went. Do you know, I, I said, any, everything you did last night, right? I said, you wanted to do, right? Cause you know, j just off like, because she's acting like nothing 
happened? And I'm like, everything you wanted to do, right? And she said to me, yeah, I had fun. Everything was cool. So I, I tell I'm like, yo, really? I'm like, yo, it's cool, bro. Like, I see you fun type shit. She said, nah, I never fuck your Really? Bro, you did. No, I didn't. She was like, I ain't gonna lie. Like, I probably got naked and like twerk for them, but I ain't never fuck them. Already I'm thinking like, I know you lying now because you're admitting to get, first of all, why would you even get naked for my <laughs> If you came for me, you don't know them. So can't... Whatever, cool. I bet. So I show her, I'm like, yo, bro, you don't gotta lie to me. It's cool. Like, I get it. Like, we, like, this is the first time I've seen her like in a year. I said, you don't gotta even lie to me. Nigga, I even show, I show her on my phone. I said, bro, look right there. She got another excuse. She said, oh, nah. So it was a video of her naked in my pool, bent over by the, the, the deck. And then one of my got his out like pause. I'm sorry. I've got to give you all the details, but I keep telling you that somebody can't ever put dirt on my name without me telling the truth. So I said, bro, like, look at this right here. She was like, uh, uh, like at first she was like, uh, uh, yeah, he might have took his out. Like, I think he rubbed his on my, but I never, I'm like, yo, bro, you really lying to me right now. So I ain't even gonna hold you. I scrolled in the video. I got the video in my shit. I scrolled in. I said, bro, here's a video of him. Then I scrolled again. I said, here's a video of him fucking you and you get off my other man's. Oh, what? What? Now, now the, now the story changed. The story now becomes, uh, oh, oh, what? Oh, I didn't know that. But she apologetic. She's like, yo, you got to believe me. Like, yo, I like. I would have never did that like yo shit I'm so sorry I would have never disrespected you like that like yo I came here for you this and third now at this point Ag said he was ready for her to go so he tells her hey my mama is coming over to visit you gotta go and she took it pretty much exactly how it was Ag was kicking her out of the house at this point she starts telling Ag that she didn't voluntarily do what was on the video and in an effort to I guess prove that when she leaves she headed straight to the police department to file charges against his friends. When she gets home, and I'm gonna be honest with you, this is the, I think, I promise, I, I honestly, to this day, I, st I still think I f***ed up by doing this because I'm shaming her now. I'm shaming her. I said to her, I said, yo, I'm gonna keep it a being with you, bro. And you came to my house and had two n****s as f*** you raw. I ain't seen no c no none. I told her, I said, yo, you should go get tested, man. Like, you done... I said, that's why, yo, you should go get tested, bro. Shorty now says to me, um, yo, I'm gonna keep it, keep it a bean with you. Like, I really don't believe I would really do that. I'm not that type of person. Yo, you right, I should go get tested. Remember, I, I told her to get tested. The next time I talked to her, she asked me one random day, like three days later, yo, could I get your friend's names and numbers? Bro, you still trying to, like, I say, yo, you f them. You can't get their name and number? Why the f you need me to get their name and number? I don't know. Like, come on, bro. Why you keep asking my You don't ask me for my, my friend's names or whatever. I said, yo, you know, I'm going to give you my man's number. I said, whatever you want to know about that night, he f you. You go talk to him. Y'all go talk. Okay. All right. When I get home, I was coming from my studio. And when I get home, 20 minutes after I get home, that's when the raid happens. So with these new charges filed, the police do what the police do best and they started an investigation, leading to them busting down the doors of his house and arresting everybody inside. My mama's screaming, she, she's saying, get the gun. I'm looking on my sh I can see his police. I put my gun away. I locked the other way, gun, guns away. They put me, my mom, Cheyenne in cuffs. They bring me down to the station. I don't know, at this point, I don't know what it's about. They're asking me about the situation. Yo, what's what, blah, 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 blah. Let me tell you why they did the raid and why they did the search warrant on my crib. And this is another thing. Yo, after that, bro, like even to this day, right now, I, I pay $4,000 for an apartment I don't go to. I got an apartment right now I do not go to because I refuse to bring people back to my crib. I'm gonna tell you why. The reason why they did that search warrant is because Shorty went to the cops and the cops reading and listen to her side of the story. They're saying, Oh yeah, Shorty got R-worded, academics got the tape, it's at his house, but he don't want to give up the tape. Now, according to Act, he has CCTV footage of the entire event, and apparently when police arrived, 
and reviewed the footage, they decided that, well, there just wasn't enough for actual charges. Um, by the way, they sent me all the time, like, yo, act you good, like, nothing, nothing with you, like, you're straight. And here's the thing, my friends who was on the tape and the girl, they didn't get charged. It was like, yo, hey, listen, there isn't enough evidence that showcased that you didn't want to fuck them. So then didn't get charged so that's basically the story with that part of it the woman made the accusation but act seemed steadfast in his response and honestly i can't imagine that he would put himself out there before she ever said anything publicly about it if he didn't 100 percent think it's exactly what he described but that's not all of the trouble with women that act has been in shortly after this he started telling the story about another one of his exes who allegedly stole a half a million dollars from him now i'm seeing reports of people saying that this was the same person that accused his friends of what went down but from everything i'm gathering this is actually a different woman that took this money i won't call me a simp and i'm gonna take it chat there was a point. I don't I don't know more. So if all y'all who think y'all got it, y'all just gonna come get a different result. There was a time I used to have a million dollars cash in my crib. That's a fact. The shorty moved to Houston. Like, whatever. You know, we like broke up or whatever. Not really peeping. Yeah, I got a million dollars in cash. A million. <laughs> Not talking about 50, a million. <laughs> One day, I get a new money counter. I said, let me try my new money counter and I get into the band. So I, I, I like count my money and wrapping the bands around the I'm sorry. I'm sorry if you're not like that, I'm sorry. So I'm counting my money. My, I had a million, I remember I had a million. Now I might've given my mom like 30 grand here. I might've, but I should have like, definitely over like 950. Nah, definitely about 100, 900 thou. Now, Ag says he wasn't sure if it was her at first, basically sitting in denial about it, but apparently she took the money and dipped out to Houston where she started splurging on herself. Re the way I found out she stole the money. She goes to Houston. Immediately she buys a $140,000 car. She gets an apartment Oh, I'm right over the Toyota Center. Okay. Now, granted, I'm a very generous guy when I'm dealing with my girl. She ain't no broke girl, just off the fact she with me. But when I realized, now I realize I, 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 I misplaced the money, I said, what the fuck? I start going back to the dates where she's leaving my crib so there's been multiple dates where her parents had to come drive up from virginia come get her ass because she's wilding or the cops had to evict her one of the times when her mom come up because she's a woman and whatever whatever i used to just like when when she's like oh i need to go get my stuff then i could leave i would just go in the corner let her and her parents or whoever walk through my crib and go get her stuff what i didn't know is that my stupid ass, she knew the combination. This is, this is a chick to like, you know, this chick is like mad, just inquisitive. She know, she knew the combination. I got eight safes in my crib. She knew the combination of every one of them, bro. I, di I swear I didn't know, bro. I swear I didn't know this. So what I realized, and this is how I, I found it and I caught her in the act and, I, and I'm gonna tell you how, I didn't get the money back. I didn't get the money, I'm gonna tell you how I get it back. After a few months down in Houston, he says that she got tired of it and was ready to come back to academics house. When she in, 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 in um, she's in um, Houston, she started doing all type of thought. She hits me back up and after, you know, because remember she has an alcohol problem. She goes out there blackout out wilding realizing that's not sustainable nobody taking it serious she's trying to come back she's also like bro she don't got no job but she got like twenty thousand dollars a month in bills she, looking back she come back my stupid ass of course i'm like entertaining it she give me access to her ring camera in houston So I kind of have it, but remember, I just found out my, my money got stolen. So I'm like, what the f I'm not even thinking it's her. I'm really thinking all type of different. 
Anyway, when I kind of get the inclination as her. So Academic says, yeah, you can come back, but first you got to give me access to your Ring camera account. She does, and Act goes back and looks at the footage and says that he can see her unpacking all of the money that she stole from him from her suitcase. I'm like, when was the, I'm, I'm trying to like mark the date the last time I counted it, because I remember it was a mill. I get the date. I figure out what happened afterwards. I said, oh, she was here then and she left then. I said, nah, she ain't gonna steal no fucking money from me. Like, I leave tens of thousands of dollars around all the time. Like, she wouldn't, like, why would she just steal? But still, it is half a million. But even I'm like, she don't even know my my safe combination. Okay. When I looked at her camera, her ring camera that's in her kitchen in Houston, right after she just moved or she just left, one of them like she leave, come back, leave. She she brought out a bunch of. She took my money in socks. I, I count my money and I put them in $50,000 wads. It was in big socks that she put them in. And when I looked at the camera in Houston, out the sock, 50,000. Out the sock, 50,000. Out the sock, 50,000. She put the money in her safe. So after being confronted with the footage, she admitted to taking the money and agrees to bring back what was left after she purchased a $140,000 car. Anyway, I confront her on the phone. I say, yo, Shane, I'm gonna keep it a being with you, yo. I don't know what's going on with you or whatever, but like, I got you on my camera. I got you on your own ring camera that I screen recorded. I still got the screen recording. I said, I could put you in jail. You know, if you go to jail for this, you're going to jail for decades, man. You stole from a who gave you everything. What's up with you? The police is waiting for me to bring them some because they're gonna run a warrant on her to see if she deposited anything. If she deposit anything, she's going to jail. She breaks down, she admits it. She says, I'm sorry. I only stole it because my feelings was hurt. I was gonna bring it back. You know that bullshit. Here's what my dumb ass do. I take her back. I tell her ass, I said, bring my, I said, put all my money in a bag half a million dollars get on the next plane in the morning and bring my half a million dollars back to my crib she did that to be honest now that's wild because academics takes her back which would never happen to me but he does take her back and it gets even worse after this on top of stealing a half a million dollars from him he also went through her phone and found out that she was cash apping other men the money that he had been giving her throughout their time together put it like this she the only weirdo that went from who's up tens of millions to a scammer in Houston, a in the practice squad and random like random, but like, I mean, random, but like, you know, I was stupid. I remember she said this to me once and I believe it. She said, yo, act. I'm dating academics. I could never fuck another without him tell you, bro. You know how she got around that? Just don't fuck anybody lit in the industry. She the bummest possible. Like the who got, yo, like this is part and i'm gonna end the story with this bro i went through her phone she was cash apping and i'm like bro you're you're sending money i'm done with you bro like it's over but anyway uh i just had to tell my full truth today uh this has been a good stream so after that the accusing him of having herpes the stealing money from him sending his pictures to other people sending his money to other people and even cheating on him he took her back but the other day he decided that he was really done and it was time to kick this woman out of his house now his live stream kicked in in the middle of this happening and you can hear her in the background freaking out and screaming yeah.
now apparently after all of this went down the police actually ended up showing up to his house and his girl ended up getting arrested on felony charges Cheyenne got locked up in a felony this morning when I showed up after my stream last night she broke my, my crib in the amounts of like when you're breaking tens of thousands maybe a hundred thousand dollars worth of stuff and the police has been to my house so many times i ain't gonna lie to you and you know because i know some of y'all y'all still on this tough whatever shit, you know i keep telling you when you got an issue with a girl you can't really even do nothing but call the cops the cops the, i could tell because my mama showed up today my mama just immediately called the cops my mom not playing it's my house though i'm really trying to tell them i'm like y'all could get her to leave type shit, but like don't lock her up the police literally looked at me and be like yo bro we've been to your house 40 times in the last couple months we're locking our ass up it's over i'm sorry like and that's basically where this story is at and while i'm at it that's also basically the entire story of dj academics i hope that you guys really enjoyed it but anyways that's it for the video guys if you did enjoy the content be sure to hit the like button subscribe tap the notification bell so you get notified every time i upload a video as always it's been fun rocking with y'all man i'm out